Good viewer, you are watching exert us. This is because exert us makes you feel good, makes you feel fulfilled. You are enjoying this. You will continue to watch exert us for a long time to come. You want to subscribe to exert us, and you will. You will like and subscribe and share. You will tell your friends. Tell your friends about exert us. Your friends will come to like exert us, much as you are liking this right now, as we speak. Thank you for subscribing to exert us. See, that was easy. Oval Office. You know what the world needs more of is like Vaishnavist Motown. You know, like some real like Hindu doo-wop. You know what I mean? Like Hare rock and roll. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> It's crazy. You know, uh, you know, like Sanskrit singers are really, you know, basically like Jesus Kirtan. It's true. And if you feed Sanskrit into it, now they can sing in God's language, Enochian. So that's good. Oh, you know, some some people came to me and they're like trying to speak in tongues. And so I was like, I start citing Sanskrit. They're like, wow, you have beautiful tongues. That's <laughs> amazing, bro. Yeah. So <laughs> How did like, you do that? <laughs> they're like, it's oh. like maybe you should practice. Yeah. It makes you wonder about like immigrant culture. <laughs> Yeah, they were speaking in tongues now, bro. <laughs> I feel like if they started with uh, immigrant culture, you know, the first tongues would have literally been their own languages and everyone would have been so impressed. It's like, oh my gosh, I've never heard that one before. That sounds like... Yeah, I can keep going. I like belt out like hundreds of verses. <laughs> That'll speaking show. in tongues. <laughs> well, you know, but the point is the same because if they feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, it quacks like a duck. You know, if, if Krishna is like a duck, Krishna is a duck. Krishna has incarnated in, you know, it says every species. So yeah, we should get a bumper sticker that says Krishna ducks around. That would be pretty good, actually. I think. But we well, were going to talk. About he definitely bobs and weaves uh, in the, in the arena because he's a demon slayer. We can pull up some pictures of that, actually. That's something that came up the other night. Someone was talking about uh, the titles of, you know, important messianic figures or Krishna, you know, the idea of the uh, serpents, right? He's he like the master of serpents, but doesn't that mean like the conqueror and not just like the biggest yeah, serpent? How's that go? Well, Kalia, this is Kalia. Oh, Kalia okay. is a serpent, of course, a multi-headed serpent that was um, hiding from... Garuda was Vishnu's carrier, but the general idea of of uh, 
conquering the serpent is is kind of like um, displaying prowess or uh, fearlessness. For example, if you see Vishnu lying asleep, like his his confidence is so high that he just he can sleep on them. He's invulnerable, so it's like a kind of a statement of invulnerability. Like he'll go to sleep, and this serpent will become his couch. So <laughs> just imagine, I will go to sleep under this cobra. So nice, so silky. <laughs> uh, but this this asa this actually uh, the the multi headed serpent of Ananta. Ananta means uh, without end. So he has unlimited heads. Is uh, said to be lying in the nadir of the universe in the base, right? So, and he's upholding all the planets on his hoods. And it's and um, there's there's actually citations from this serpent. He talks in the. He's a sage actually. He's actually a form of the godhead. So he's a sage. Say um, his name again. Ananta. 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 Ananta Deva or Ananta Shesha. Ananta. Yeah, there he is. He's Ananta. It's also a name of Vishnu. He is Vishnu also, but he's he's kind of like um, what's called, I mean, we're getting technical, but Vaibhav Prakash. He is like, uh, he is equal to, but he is like uh, showing a different style. So Vaibhav, I guess you could say it's like a different mood or style. So even though he is God, he's taking the mood as a devotee of God. But so what's interesting though about the Ananta Shesh, um, form is that you're seeing he's got infinite heads and he says this is what he says about which is very interesting i think is a point well taken for any tradition is that he has been chanting the glories of the lord um with all of his infinite mouths since time immemorial and he says i have yet to even cross one drop of that ocean wow That's, so like there's always more to be revealed about uh about the supreme personality of Godhead, so it's not it's not finite; it's infinite. So, I mean, this is an interesting concept. We've talked a bit about this idea of you know meta personalities or something, but you just called it moods of God, and I think that's really interesting. So, you know, this seems like something broader than just a personhood, right? Because they're able to have personhoods as moods, have and have serpents with infinite heads as moods. What does that mean in like the broad uh, scope of, you know, Veda in terms of like reality? Like, what do you, how far do you take this in terms of reality? How does this, uh, how do you use this? Okay. So one of the things I need to disclose is my situatedness in a particular tradition. That is the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition um, known in the West as Hare Krishna, but uh, that's like that's like if you call the Christians the Hallelujahs. Hare <laughs> 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 is the female Godhead, and Krishna is the male Godhead, right? But they're specifically steeped in the philosophy of dramaturgy. Dramaturgy meaning the philosophy regarding plays, playwriting, and drama, and what is the flavor of, uh, or you know, like phenomena. It, this is more of a phenomenological reading of the Veda. So being situated in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, it's um, drawing from, you know, obviously older Vaishnava traditions, but all of the content of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition is not really new. It's something that's just becoming, because the Vedas are so big, it takes a while for some of these things, these bubbles to like sort of surface. So when we talk about moods, this is a very Gaudiya type thing. Gaudiya just means Bengal, it means East India. Goda. That's one of the names of that area. It is a traditional name. Another name was Kalinga. There's a couple other names. Uh, Goda means like golden. It might have something to do with the um, the soil uh, being so valuable, you know, with all the silt runoff from the Himalaya. So the Ganga and the Gangetic Basin, you know, um, you know that soil is extraordinarily rich. Any, they, they used to say anything you plant there will just grow. Um, so I was teeming with life. And um, so Goda means just golden. So uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism means that Vaishnavism as uh, this flavor from Bengal. And the thing about Bengal is there is a big migration of pundits from Kashmir, you know, in the Himalayas down into Bengal. And they specialized in poetry. So the idea of poetry really in India starts to take form. If you go North India, like Kashmir, you know, uh, the Brahmanas in Kashmir brought 
uh, a lot of their f phenomenology. So when we use these kind of like big words, phenomenology is not a is not really a difficult word to understand. It's just the philosophy of experience. What is what is the content of experience, right? If you study phenomenology, so there's a migration down from uh, Kashmir down to Bengal to uh, that area, and the moods, the idea of moods or bhav. Uh, these moods of uh, God, this is a interpretation based in, like I said, dramaturgy coming from like playwright. So trying to understand like what is the mood that the hero should portray in the play? They're like it's like method acting, right? What is the mood that the heroine should portray? Or like which moods are not well suited to um, mix? Like some moods should not be mixed, and that's called rasabas. Like you're mixing. It's like a poor taste to like, like you wouldn't mi mix disgust, like the mood of disgust with like um, the new uh, budding uh, love, like like fresh love, like when uh, a love, a love that's just starting where there's uh, infatuation, like you wouldn't mix disgust. It would be like an improper. It'd be like you have a, you have like some pudding and then you start like sh putting pepper or salt all over it or something and you're just like it's not correct so yeah it does have a sense of flavor or moods are connected in this way so when i say moods yeah it's kind of like a loaded um and that's actually like ramping up to the very high part of of sanskrit language culture is dealing with uh, poetics so like you would have to understand sanskrit grammar before you like really get into like sanskrit poetics because there's a lot of manipulation of the language so the idea that I know is super roundabout, but the idea that God has moods, this is this is very old. Um, this uh, seems to uh, go all the way back into like the Mahabharat, or even the Veda, where um, you are uh, looking, you're seeing you're seeing like what's like called the Leela or the play, like again returning to the play or the drama, the play of God, and so at different stages there's different moods. You know, and that God relishes these moods. I almost wish I could get away from the word God, but uh, Ishwara. Uh, well, okay, that's another one that's interesting because, yeah. I mean, I think it's worth it to look at it both ways, obviously. I mean, I'm talking to people that are super religious on one side that look at everything like, you know, it's this single parent who writes books. And then people who are looking at it like it is only the collective amount of everything combined, like the sum of all things, right? There's like... This seems to be kind of both camps. You don't seem to be necessarily in either of those camps, right? You're saying that those are both the sum of all things and the personhood or mood. Is that right? Am I right? Say more. Say more. So what do you, so what is, when you're thinking about this idea of like Narayana, right? Like we've talked a bit about this idea of like source. There's like source that's beyond anything created is anything created happens within eternal eternal source and anything that ends any ending or completion oh i see what you're saying like so like like having so if we just uh, use the word causation or cause when you talk about source you're talking about things that have beginnings and ends right but then what about those things which have no beginnings and no ends right so um How many are there isn't it is it more than narayana like what is beyond source Narayana. The idea of Narayana, well, like just the grammar of that word, right. Narayana is like the shelter, the ayana of Nara. Nara means um, man or humans, right? So the one to whom which one should go for shelter, right? Narayana. Right. Isn't, it, isn't there something about like being a boat in the water or something also? Narayana is a boat. You know, there's everything in Hinduism. At one point, he becomes a fish, and like there's a deluge, right? Like diluvian uh, event where um, he saves the Vedas. So uh, the king finds out, like in his dream, like Narayan comes to him and says, "I might, I might just be misreading stuff, but the waters are called Nara, for the waters are indeed the offspring of Nara, as they were his first residence, Ayana." And he then is called Narayana, Narayana. Yeah, so there's so many of these kind of like what you call etymologies or faux etymologies. The, the, just technically from like a Sanskrit um, perspective, Nara has so many meanings. The most common one is man. 
Uh, Nara could also mean water. That's true. Water it vessel is, or man is, vessel. I like that it's both because we are mostly water. So, I mean. Well, now when you talk about water in the Vedic uh, concept, you're, you're talking about as the feminine, the divine feminine, the waters up us. You're talking about the cosmic waters in which all things are situated. Even the, even the Supreme God is lying down in the waters. Right. Is that, so is this not, is this Mahadevi then? Or what is, is that? The Mahadevi, fair? yeah, that is the waters. Yeah, you know your stuff, man. So <laughs> he's in the waters, lying in the waters, right? In fact, he's, he's sleeping. There's a, there's a legend where he's sleeping and uh, two demons um, come out of his earwax, Madhu and Kaitaba. And he's sleeping wow. and uh, that sleep is actually the Mahadevi. So the waters are also pertaining to the sleep. So all the worlds are like floating in these waters. And that snake is also in these waters, right? The snake is holding the worlds up in the waters, right? Uh, but this waters is basically to be identified with the Ganga. So the Ganga is actually originally these waters, and it has pierced through down and leaking down into the universe as the, the river Ganga. But these are the cosmic waters. This is what's called Shakti or energy. And these waters are like the proto-cosmic feminine so the Lord is is sleeping down, sleeping in his own waters, but these waters are like the dream. He's he's dreaming, right? So essentially, one way to interpret, um, I heard one philosopher say, one way to interpret this is that Hinduism mm -hmm. is like the dream trying to understand the dreamer. Right, so which is like, pretty much metaphysics at the end of the day. The idea that the 10-dimensional string theory is every possibility happening so we are the dream, like the sum of all things is the dream of the dreamer. We certainly have so many aspects or dimensions to ourselves. My wife is a physicist. And so every time I try to bring up metaphysics with her, she just starts talking about math and then my head hurts. <laughs> no, I, I try to go there with her. I'm actually planning to have her teach me uh, like calculus and beyond, but I um, have to, I'm a father, so I have to raise my Son. It will, will involve her in game uh, design because all games these days are just physics. It's all you know, a lot of people game. abuse physics. So yeah. you're going <laughs> to, if, so one of the things is it's become very popular for people like uh, Deepak Chopra or whatever to talk nonsense about like, you know, um, like quantum consciousness or like something like, you know, you have the cosmic egg, the cosmic egg. Well, the cosmic egg is the Brahmanda. So yeah, the co what's called cosmogony, like how the, I guess to change the subject again, uh, the cosmogony. No, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. You keep going with that. We'll go back to that. I don't want to interrupt you. Well, it's just that physics gets abused. Like people try to make quantum physics say things that it's only maybe implying. It's not like really. You know, the guy we, do, we, do we know uh, was one of the Nexium guys, yeah. part of the Nexium cult. Nexium? Yeah. You tell me, what's that? Nexium was like the sex trafficking with like celebrities, mind control, cult. Oh, you heard of, <laughs> oh was that that tattoo there. thing that people were tripping out about a couple yeah. years ago? Yeah, like, oh, brand. Man. They weren't, they weren't. Was, uh, what do we know? What the bleep do we know is those people? Yeah, well, he was, he was the right-hand man of Keith Rainier. Was the, you know, so what Jeez. the bleep do we know? Nexium. <clears throat> Currently yeah, watching, are, yeah. uh, their will extends beyond their knowledge, so they commit these well, again. Like, it is what it is, but the point is, quantum physics gets abused. I 100% agree, but it's also interesting. Well, meta metaphysics is, is uh, physics in general gets abused, but quantum physics is abusing metaphysics and quantum and, and regular physics. All right, point is, a lot of people think that you know, religion and science are op oppositional. And then there are people that are saying, well, realistically, a lot of physics, like the Big Bang Theory, is coming from Catholicism because Jesuits were into that. However, they're not really looking at the fact that the Jesuits, especially were European Jesuits, interested in the Veda. And the Veda has even more connections to um, inspirations for our modern physics, right? And even this idea of multidimensionality or um, singularity or, you know, different levels of consciousness uh, or awareness of dimension. These are things that actually maybe originate with certain kinds of Hinduism or, you know, different traditions. Yeah, definitely in the 1800s, like in the um, European, you know, like kind of like tail end of the European enlightenment becoming more towards like modernity, 
and then this horrible word postmodernity, <laughs> indescribable word, um, an undefinable word. But um, there is a like, what do you call it? This like budding archaeological, anthropological, you know, mass of information coming, and definitely the Jesuits, you know, did a lot in terms of acting as a, I don't know, like intelligence gathering, you know, like interacting. For sure. with their yeah, yeah. yeah, it's not all bad. They they did good stuff too. Um, gathering intelligence sounds like a, you know. Yeah, it idea. did. It did. Uh, so yeah, then you have the, all these cultures start interacting. Um, you know, whether it came from the Vedas or not, I can say that there are very strange things in the Vedas. And also calculus seemed, may have been discovered like a long time ago also, or like High levels right. of trigonometry, like thousands of years before anybody. You remember like Srinivasa Ramanujan, right? This like yeah, like I haven't looked into him too much, um, but yeah, I'm I'm aware he had some uh, calculations that were like, either he is a British plant or proof that there is calculus in the Veda. You know, in the Pan I will Pan definitely Pan defer to you on that. Um, I'm like. <laughs> I study more like Sanskrit, like I'm more literary. My wife is a physicist. She can answer more physics questions, but I'll, let me give you an example, like why, like physics, I couldn't get my wife to like, how do you say it? Assent to my ideas regarding her, her field. Like, so when she can't she, have your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like she, like she, she doesn't, she doesn't accept my take on physics. So, but even though I think it's legit and I think if, if I give it enough time, she would maybe accept. Uh, so she told me something very interesting. She, she said, um, well, we were talking about randomness and um, she told me in the math perspective, and I think this, this idea benefits anybody. Um, and I'm interested to hear what you think about this in the math perspective. Randomness is on a spectrum, right, between zero and one. And if something is, the more closer you get towards randomness, the more um, the probability moves towards zero. So, and then as something becomes more and more probable, it, it moves away from randomness, moves towards order. So I was like, well, then, then the next logical conclusion is that there is no random and that there's only order. And she's like, no. <laughs> so then I was like, what do I do with that then? Because you're telling me that randomness, the probability of randomness is zero. Highly improbable. It's zero. I mean, according no, there's to- a small, there's, a, there's a small range though, right? There's a, there's a very small one. range of like, so that is the differences of choice maybe. That's like, that, co that constitutes free will or something. That small freak, you know, amount of randomness. Well, I would, I would, well, I, you know, looking at the determinant or indeterminate or what do you call it? It's funny. There's a word in philosophy called uh, libertarianism, but it's not, it's not libertarianism. It means the belief in free will. Uh, people get confused. Like when you start talking about libertarians. Believe it exists. You know, well, that's like new. Libertarians. Yeah. Those are the people that we, we put in the gutters or, you know, they're hard. hard <laughs> I'm going to be interviewing a couple libertarian candidates this year. So yeah, yeah, I know we, we kid the libertarians. We love you. We love you. Yeah. I'm just joking. I know a lot of people are into libertarianism. <laughs> I think you need a little bit of a safety net though for people. Oh God. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah. So, anyway, it's not have to go political here, yeah. but the idea that uh, the free will exists, libertarianism, um, <laughs> the yeah. free will exists. Right. You believe it exists. You believe free you will believe, exists. Or, or that it doesn't exist. You have a hard to Determinism, or there's something called compatibilism, where you have to have a order set on which to choose from. But right? you're you not have Calvinist. To, you have to have you a limited structure in, to even make a decision. So you have to have order, or some limit to free will, and actually to order to have will. What's that called? That's what I mean. nothing. You can't choose and avoid. There's nothing to choose. There's no object. What's that determinate free will called? I want that. The determinate one, this compatible, yeah, where you believe that there is there is a system has to be there for you to make choices. I That's believe called that. compatibilism. I believe in. I guess I'm a compatible. Yeah, but I'm like halfway right. There's like some free will and there's some order set that in some hierarchy of causation and all that. Yeah, I'd say I'm more to the belief that there's like a system in place, but it's amazing how much you can manipulate a system. So, so in terms of like the Vedas, uh, it seems like there is compatibilism, right? So you have like a karmic um, matrix on which, in order to uh, make decisions, and your 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 previous self is impinging on your current self in the form of your 
your the actions of your previous self, right? Which you know is not it's it's just a reasonable thought. Like, yeah, like the decisions I made earlier in my life are affecting me now. In this point, like, did I try hard or did I not try hard? Or did something unfortunate happen? Or did something fortunate happen? Or why are Hold on for a second. Happening? This is my chance to play the song. Always are you there? So frozen. We'll be waiting until Noel's back. I'm here. Oh, you are? Okay. Sorry, I got there was a froze there. I was like, this is my chance to play the, the Hindu Motown. What Say was what you're that? Hindu Motown, tell me more. <laughs> I want to hear Sorry. about Hindu Motown. Oh, oh, no, I know it's great. The Bhagavad like, Gita whispers wisdom in my soul. There's something there. We could put I'd like, that. I'd like to hear it. some like George Clinton, like P funk. Oh yeah, that would be really I'll stylish. I'll get that functional. I think I we can that, make that happen. Real mothership connection here with oh, Star yeah, Tower. actual mothership. Star Tower, yeah. Mahadevit, Mahadevit, Mahadevit. Try Mahadevit. to get George Clinton on. Try to get George Clinton on, bro. That's a good point. All right, we'll work it's on it. This can't be hard. You just have to like put crack at the end of a like fishing line and then like reel him towards the get, get Sir Nose in here, devoid of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I can't swim. <laughs> but we were we were talking about like the idea of you know chaos and order and like compatibilism i mean it seems like the idea is that there is a system in place and you think it's maybe more that we have free will than that there is a system in place like that's a stronger part of the marriage of equation so like to go to the very bottom deep layer like ones and zeros in the veda you have dharma right and or ritta ritta is like the proto dharma rit rit or rig like rig veda is like natural order something like that like first what do you call it first order logic or something you have like a, a natural Line underlying pulse, like the structure. numbers exist straight lines like curves yeah i see you know that's not a bad definition dharma is like notoriously difficult word you know and it means a lot to a lot of different groups um but there is like a there is a what do you call it? A cosmic order, right? Now oh, the Vitruvian Dharma, that should be a picture. So there is an order. Um this is your Dharma. A lot of that is so, but there the concern there with the order is that the Vedas um are there to maintain the order in the sense of to continue the the sacrificial process that upholds the order. Like the order is upheld through sacrifice. So, like, why does the sun follow that law? Why does it not deviate and start moving around? It's like, because it follows Dharma. It follow what makes the sun rise? It says in the, there's a famous line in the Mahabharat where uh, Yudhishthira comes to a lake after his, his brothers have all failed these, like, kind of tests at the lake and they drop dead. And then he's there and he's an incarnation of Dharma and there's a spirit in the lake and the spirit asks him what makes the sun rise and he says, Dharma. Dharma makes the sun rise. So the sun follows you could say the will of God. It doesn't deviate out of fear of God. <laughs> Something like that. But in this case, the God is not like the Christian God. This God is like natural order or Dharma. So upholding Dharma is is the prime directive of the Veda. Like that structured order, order of reality is maintained by the continual performance of sacrifice. And so um, Vishnu is is the what's called Adiyagna. He is the first sacrificer and he is the first offering of sacrifice and therefore he becomes um, the first recipients of sacrifice. Now, I know how you hate telling Westerners how things are compatible or rem reminiscent of their own understandings, but doesn't that sound kind of like a thing that people could relate to in their beliefs already? This idea of a he's the savior and the, um, what do you call it? The first sacrificer and sacrificed? Yeah, he is the first sacrificer. He is the he sacrifices himself. Like there's a statement in the upon Dang, you know? I am one. I want to be many. Right? And so in the real hard story, not to connect dots right now for you. No, I no, no. Mean. So you can connect dots. So here's my contention though, is like 
I think synchrot synchrot synchronous what do you call it? Syncretic work is super important. I just I just object to people like prematurely like um concluding the accuracy of their syncretism before right. doing the work of both of the things you're trying to syncretize. Like right. we should have a misunderstanding there. here and a misunderstanding here, and then you join those two misunderstandings. What's the result of that? That's exactly. So we shouldn't yeah, stop like, there. We should continue to, oh. to delve deeper into, to tell us more about Vishnu and how he's maybe the same and different, you know, what are the different compare and contrast? That is actually, no, no, you made a legitimate comparison there. The only thing is I was trying to, cause uh, I actually, you know, everybody uh, nowadays likes the idea of, um, you know, finding the roots of, of humanity and what, where we totally, are, yeah. you know, like with like the, the mud flood and all. Like it would be nice to have an objective truth of about the world. creation, the cosmogony. Yeah, we'd love that. Yeah, different cosmogonies. Like, where do they connect? You know, I'm, I'm all for that. Only thing is, I was just, uh, I just object to like the premature syncretism. That's all. Uh, I, sure. I think syncretism is actually almost like a goal that everyone should have. But like, I just think the standard of what it would take to actually achieve that is like, is pretty, it's pretty demanding. I mean, it's asking a lot of a person. So like the same thing, like we need some interface between the science and religion, like quantum physics, maybe a starting place, but the kind of person you need to actually do that work. It's like, it's like we would all like to do that work or see that work done, but like who, who is the right one to do that is the one who is like steeped in both at the same time or like working in tandem very carefully. There's a lot of, I hope I don't upset any Indian engineers here. There's a lot of Indian engineers who like love their culture and they're like, Oh, I just want to like go back and find out more about who I am. And then they like try to apply their like scientific mind, but they like don't do the work of actually like studying Shastra and Sanskrit. And then, so they're like, they have good intentions. They just never, um, they never get an adequate effort rolling to actually achieve that syncretism. So that's like, I guess that's the critique I'm, I'm kind of, Putting forward is how like quantum physics gets abused by Hindus or just by New Agers and more more by New Agers. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, you made the great point that <laughs> you made the great point that people will uh, synchronize and then they'll stop looking, and it's kind of like the zeitgeist thing. You're like, oh look, these parts have a little in common, and they just don't look into the rest. Okay, well now let's look into that character more. Let's look into that story more and try to understand it. Unfortunately, v Vishnu is a lot more difficult. It's a lot more complicated. It's a much more complex thing than just a person or a place or a thing. So <laughs> well, a person is a lot more complex also. Like the idea of a personal God is actually the most complex that, that we can have as persons. Uh, there, So in India, there's the personal and the impersonal, right? the form and the formless, right? So you can even be an atheist and live in the formless, impersonal part of Hinduism and you're, you're, you know, you're part of society. You know, people may disagree with, you know, you know, the, the flavor or like, you know, that like, it's a matter of taste, right? Like, you know, my mom used to say, it's, what is it? There's no, uh, religion is a matter of taste or love is a matter of taste, right? You know, what somebody finds attractive, somebody else may not find attractive so in hinduism it's interesting it's like a variety of things hinduism really should just be called dharma which is actually kind of difficult because um buddhists also claim dharma and so do, you could say the jains you could make an argument the jains are a dharma tradition i you know uh dharma is not it's not exclusive to a single tradition uh the idea dar just means to hold or to uphold Right, so there, there's your structure, I guess. There's something or someone is upholding. I would argue from the Vaishnava perspective or the Vedic perspective of, because uh, the Buddhists and the Jains don't do not subscribe to the Veda, although their culture is steeped in the Veda. Um, that uh, that sacrifice is that thing that's upholding our existence. Like they, they, at the bottom of everything, like why do things exist? Because there has been a perpetual sacrifice that's ongoing that produces the support for that existence. So, all right. Do you want to talk about Dharma first or should we talk a bit more about Vishnu? Where do you want to start? Oh, yeah, yeah. Vishnu. So the, so the thing is, where is Vishnu and all this? He is the original sacrificer, Adi Um, And uh, so he is the first recipient of sacrifice. So, so like there's, so when it comes to Vishnu or Vaishnavism or Shiva and Shaivism or Shakti, and Shaktaism or Shakta Tantra or Shakta Bhakti, you know, these are like your general categories of like, um, 
what's called Ishta Deva, Ishta Deva. So it's not like I would like to use the word religion to make it simpler, but like the personality to which the practitioner identifies with. So like if somebody's a Vaishnava, they're connecting to Vishnu, right? That's their chosen deity. Ishta means chosen, desired, or uh, worshipped. Uh, but the word ish, that root ish, has a very much a desire sense to it. Um, like wish, possibly, is connected in there. Um, ishta, deva. So deva, again, people say gods, but dev, div comes from div, datu, the root div means to play or to shine. So the gods of India are shining, playful ones. And is he literally they, holding the earth right now? And it's and like, that's the earth? Is that the earth? No, this is Hanuman. Hanuman is there holding the hill with the herbs to uh, retrieve. It is a it is a piece of earth. Uh, it's like a it's mountain. Not pole earth. Okay. No, no, I thought no. that might be North Pole or something. The earth is upheld. Um, you could pick a, a picture of Varaha if you want to see Vishnu upholding the earth. Varaha, he's like he's a boar. He's a tusker. Varaha. He's a, he's got tusks. He's got a, he's a. He's a pig, which is really funny because, like, I don't know if you've been, you know, you've been to Italy, right? You know how, like, there's, like, like dirty words in Italy, like, or slangs. Like, in Italy, like, the slangs are against God. They're like, mm -hmm. Dio. you know, like, God is yeah. a pig. And I'm thinking, yes, he's a very nice pig, you know, but they're thinking, <laughs> oh, he's a pig. I'm like, yes, yes, he's a beautiful, wondrous pig, you know? <laughs> yeah, I wonder about that. Maybe you know, the Hindus. The jokes on the them. They're actually glorifying the Lord. <laughs> no, yeah. Wow. So, uh, but the connection there in Varaha is that um, Earth is connected in Shankya to the sense of smell. That's why, um, and the pig has a you know a strong sense of smell. So he's the what? He's the husband. The Vishnu takes his form of a pig to marry the Earth. So, but you were talking. It's the Devati, and it just showed the Hanuman as an Ishta Devati. Uh, oh, Ishta Devata. Uh, Devata. Deva or Devata is the same thing. Um, Ta is just like adding like a little bit of an honorific there. Um, Ishta means worship. So you get to choose the face of God you want to worship. So like in the in back in the Vedas, like the Purusha, Purusha Suktam, it says Sahasrashirsha Purushaha. So the Purusha has a thousand faces, right? Sahasraksha, he has a thousand eyes. Sahasrapada, he has a, a thousand feet, right? So if you just focus on the, the thousand faces, um, I think it's it's a fair interpretation to say that um, we are all a part of that Purusha, you know, like our faces are also included, but also our, our feelings, our ideas, our religions, our worlds, our... Um, you can find some face of God facing towards you, particularly. You know, so the Ishta Deva is that form of the Lord which resonates with you that you you find shelter in. So you get to you you know, like if if you want to worship uh, the Lord as a, in the female form as Devi, as the or Ishwari, supreme the supreme goddess or supreme mother. Um, a lot of famous gurus had actually, like Yogananda, people don't know this, but Yogananda was actually a Kali worshiper. And he had great difficulty, actually, um, because he couldn't express this in the West because they kept demanding some kind of Christian connection. Uh, it was a very famous, a lot of people have read, this was a lot of people's first introduction to uh, Indian philosophy or yoga. Or That's mysticism. funny because if you talk to the Jesuits, right, Mother Mary worship, and there's already a lot there. Right, but, but bring up a picture of Kali and see, can... Bring a picture of Kali, though. Is this this is something that like the West would easily unpackage back in like the middle 1900s? Like they look at this and they're like, "Oh, it's a demon," you know? Like it's like actually. Well, it's hold right on now. Let me show you a picture of Mother Mary from my church as a kid. Yeah, you have a cool Mary here. Yeah, not well, Mary's right. always cool, but yeah, yeah, she's always stepping on a snake. You know, yeah. killing a bunch of demons. Let me see if we can find an example. There's actually Mary with a sword. Is there married with a severed head? I mean, stepping on the serpent. Hold on. There definitely is in Spain. I'm sure I could find uh, Mary with uh, Mar Mother Mary with head of Moor. I'm sure I could find one. Moor, huh? Yeah, in Spain, they have all these pictures of, you know, like, uh, if I could find like a 
Spanish Moors, statue. as in like the Turks. Yeah, they like or oh, Africans. Snap. There's always there's always statues of like Jesus killing or like other dudes killing, um, you know, Africans. This is oh, Spain, bro. bro. You think this is America? This is Spain. But actually, we'll go back to that for a second. Look at that little boy with him. <laughs> that thing? This is Spain, bro. This is what it's like there. They got He's people got that weird, like, wizard hat, Kidnap like, kids, burn down buildings. Stuff. They still have rituals where people take their furniture and throw it into the street and light it on fire. This is Spain. But yeah, I've been there as a kid. The only thing I can remember, though, is paella. Here's and Mary with a staff murdering demons. There you go. Now this and is she's got going. heads and everything else. But your like that. average, your average, this is Spain. Your average non Jesuit is... doesn't know the truth. Okay, fine, this, you got me. All right, this, this is these are these guys are Giga Chads. All right, but the Giga Chads know that Mother Mary is Kali. Yes, okay, we're good. Down. Okay, so so yeah, you can understand like people have a little bit difficulty unpackaging certain iconographies, right? Like if you tell them oh, the like, plebeians. Like, okay, okay, sure, yeah. Severed arms are karma. The severed heads are material knowledge. The sword is is spiritual knowledge, and the big severed head is uh, ego or like an agentive ego. All right, American Christians never seen Mary do any cool things before. No, no, no. Yogananda literally, he might have left his body because he was so upset that he couldn't uh, preach about Kali. That's a bummer. Because you got to think like there's definitely people that would have been open. It's a bummer. I yeah. bet you there was, you know, and it's, you know, it's really interesting. Almost none of the people in the self-realization fellowship actually know that he's a Kali Bhakta. Wow. But there's, there's letters, there's letters where he's writing. I cannot describe you to the Christians. So can you explain a bit like, so why is Kali different than the Mahadevi? Like when people talk about. No, they're not the different. Kali, Kali is simply a warrior manifestation. She's getting her hands dirty in like the heat of battle. When like the right. battle gets like more inflamed, then she becomes more inflamed. But she doesn't more start more off with that. She starts off at Durga. If you can show a picture of Durga, Durga is also a martial uh, goddess. So how much spell on that? D U R G A Durga. It's just googling me up to Vajra. Durga is the Mahadevi. The Mahadevi actually is like the United. Why family. did you become Vajra? Durga D D U R G A Durga. There you go. She's riding on a tiger, right? She's okay. got weapons and many hands, right? She's yeah, she's yeah, a right. demon slayer. Yeah, so she's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She's great. She looks awesome. Yeah, yeah. And then she gets even more, uh, how do you say, berserk, and she becomes Kali. Kali's like berserker form of Durga. Oh, shit. So she, okay. she has to go, and then she starts, like, destroying the demons by the thousands and millions, you know. Uh, and Shiva has to stop her in order to preserve some balance. So that's when he lays down in her path. She puts her foot on him. And oh, because it was going to be too, bad, too much. She's going to kill all the demons. And you yeah, she's going to kill them all. You know? Uh, so, so the idea quick. is... Uh, uh, this one. This is where you can buy the demon heads. That have been Master Cast at Target. Wish I had a lighter. You know? we gonna show them now the demons have been slain. That their heads are being displayed in the in the coffee with the coffee. Okay, cool. We're good. Sorry. Anyway, you're good, bro. It's your show, man. I'm just here to I'm supporting. <laughs> I'm best supporting you're... actor here. <laughs> it's your dharma. I'm just here as karmic consequence. We can okay. jump all over the place. It's all good. But, the Vaishnavism thing, though, this angle is kind of like um, Vishnu is the maintainer, right? So you have creation, you have destruction, but you have the one that it's always maintaining. Also, the times are associated with the three deities. Uh, the past is associated with Shiva because it's been destroyed, right? Bhuta, Bhuta Kal means uh, Bhuta is another name of Shiva. Uh, it is uh, what the past has been destroyed, right? It no longer exists, right? Brahma is the future. Right, he's creating the future, but Vishnu is the, the present, he's the now. Right, uh, another thing, Vishnu sattva, sattva means goodness. So, they've divided everything into these to really um, understand. There's a lot of moving parts, that's what's so you know, it's like a steep uphill climb. But Raja, 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 Raja doesn't mean bad, right? What's the deal with Rajas means uh, like dusty. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> no, yeah, it does. Rudge, yeah. Rudge means dust. That makes sense. But, uh, so it's kind of like clarity to darkness. Tamas is darkness. Sattva is like uh, reality, right? Sat, reality, existence, reality. And then um, Rajas is like murky. So, um, and then these things have energy. So Sattva's energy is knowledge, right? Is there a, t I was just thinking like, why is Raja and Rajas? They're like, is there a connection at all? Oh, be like king and the dust, Rajas? Yeah. They might originally share a root, a root verb. But a lot of the times when you go into Sanskrit dictionaries, you're going to see um, there's a differentiation of the root. Of course. Like one will be yeah. like runge and the other will be like, it'll have a different, a strong version it'll have a different derivation. You could make, you know, I thought of an argument, but I, uh, how to unite them, but I haven't seen anybody say this. Um, and that from the tantric perspective, maybe Rajas is the highest because it combines light and darkness. Mm. So perhaps Rajas that for the, some of the tantrics is supreme, but uh, I don't think that's, that's not the standard interpretation. Now, that's like my speculation of, it's not even I even believe in that, but that that's the correct interpretation. I was just trying to, right, was just trying to figure out, out like why does yeah. this root word look the same with this yeah. other root word? Is I mean, it's a, you would think it's a big deal because the idea that kings and majestic lifestyle like would be connected in any way. Definitely, I I, I agree, man. I, I I know. I think there's something there. I think you're onto something there. Right, <laughs> Raj also means to shine. Right, but generally rajas is is um, connected to activity and to desire, right? From rajas, kama is born, desire, and from desire, uh, karma is born. Right, so this is how you get entangled in the <laughs> material world, <laughs> samsara. Now tamas, tamas is more like stolid, like lazy, stuporous, like ignorant, like dark, darkness, like your, like uh, exhaustion like inertia, like inability to get started, like tamas. So um, there's this eclipses. <laughs> you can answer this. Curious what Noel would uh, have to say about eclipses. I didn't mean to interrupt your thought. You can answer no, 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 that. What am I saying? We're all over the map here. We can do systematic stuff later if you want. <laughs> Just interrupt us. You're good. Eclip oh, yeah, what I do I think about eclipses? We can answer that. Uh, well, I, I can just talk about um, the Vedic uh, aspect or like the Jyotish. So, or the legends, not even the, the astrological. Um, there's actually a lot of misconception about the uh, the eclipse in the Vedic world. Um, one is that the eclipse is inauspicious. It's not inauspicious uh, if you use that time to do something auspicious. <laughs> so, uh, the eclipse kind of punishes you for not doing some type of practice or sadhana. Like during an eclipse, supposedly you get a million times the benefit if you do a spiritual practice on an eclipse. If you don't, it damages you. <laughs> so there's a lot of astrology in uh, in Indian stuff, like all like especially in tantra. Tantra is all about astrology. Like if you want to meet a god face to face, sometimes astrology is involved to like meet that time, to like find like go to a place and like do a certain practice and then meet them face-to-face -face. Um, but eclipse is the eclipse is 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 thought to be a planet called Rahu and Rahu uh, the legend is that Rahu is one of the Asura or I don't want to use the word demon but he's like they're against the gods or the Deva I don't want to use the word gods but anyway just for practical purposes Rahu he crosses behind enemy lines sits with the gods and tries to drink the nectar that's being distributed by Vishnu and uh, so he sneaks behind enemy lines he's very brave he's heroic and uh, Vishnu gives him that nectar and he knows but he gives it to him but then the sun and the moon complain about Rahu they said oh an Asura is sitting amongst us and you just gave him the elixir of life the nectar of immortality so Vishnu goes okay and he cuts his head off with the disc right Actually, in this, in this, can you bring up Mohini? Bring up Mohini Murti. Mohini. 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 This is where um, Vishnu takes the form of of a enchantress or seductress, um, the most beautiful woman, and he uses this form of his to confuse the asura, 
uh, the, the passionate uh, demons and to distribute the, the elixir of life, of immortality. Amrita. Amrita means not death. And you could always tell when a, a Vedic deity, especially Vishnu, is trying to you know sedu seduce you, because it's not enough that they're beautiful or that they have a song. No, it's all of it, or that they're riding on a swan. It's all of it at once. This is the all whole the, all the iconography has meaning. Every single thing you see in iconography has meaning. In the, these are like meditational um, visualizations. So like. Uh, on the swan, this is associated with Brahma, knowledge, or Saraswati, she's playing the instrument, the instrument is sound, sound is knowledge, you know, because you learn through your ear, like we're all listening now, it's primarily, you're, we're seeing our faces, but we're also having a discussion about knowledge, you know, uh, the lotus represents the heart, or beauty, and uh, the soul even, and she's, Saraswati here is holding the scriptures, and she's supposed to be holding beads somewhere, where she's meditating on some beads that she's like chanting on some beads, you know, but um, yeah, so all these things are, have particular, that's one of the things about Hinduism, it, it tries to reach you through all of your senses, through food, through incense, through flowers, through sounds, through music, uh, through meditation, through the mind, through the intellect and the scriptures, through physical activities, you know, like go, walking around on pilgrimage or uh, cleaning the temple it just tries to get to every single one of your senses it, it, there's there's ways you can, you can worship the lord through any of the five senses um like fire is the eye. like if you offer fire it's like you're offering your sight you know if you offer beautiful smelling flowers you're offering the scent you know so what's the story with the mohini in terms of um so mohini mohini means uh, moha means bewilderment mohini is she's causing bewilderment so she's so beautiful that like they're all distracted, you know, they got their tongues out. Why, so, did, uh, why did Vishnu decide to do this? To cheat, to cheat the, uh, the demons and to side with the gods. You know, um, the gods and demons churned the ocean of milk to get the nectar. And uh, this is a South Indian. Definitely thick. <laughs> really? Yeah. Pretty, pretty thick. Uh, <laughs> So uh, anyway, this is my favorite uh, Mohini. So yeah, yeah, Rahu, Rahu, the eclipse. We're still talking about the eclipse, my friend. The eclipse. Um, All right, here's your because he got your, here's your English Mohini, Mohini fed Mohini. him the nectar. She fed him the nectar, so his head became immortal. But she cut it off before the the nectar could reach down into his heart and into his, uh, you know, his belly. So um, so his head and mind is immortal, but he still has those passionate historic heart or desire or even heroic brave i mean if you think about it he went behind enemy lines to to, to get to get a taste of that amrita to get the elixir of life so he is a hero he's a very brave brave uh demon i guess and he even sat amongst the gods he sat amongst the righteous so he kind of traitored against the uh against the the negative forces to get that uh you know he switched sides but there, he has a, an inimical fight with the moon and the sun because the moon and the sun pointed him out. So Chandra and Surya said, hey, this is not one of our guys, you know? And then so Vishnu said, okay, okay. And he cut his head off, you know, uh, as Mohini, right? But his head became immortal and his head attacks, his head attacks uh, the moon or the sun and that's what the eclipse is. So it's considered to be inauspicious because the sun is the symbol of self. And the moon is a symbol of mind. So when there's an eclipse, there's some negative force coming over the self or the spirit. There's some negative force coming over the uh, mind. However, Vaishnavas, what they do is they just chant the names of Vishnu. And uh, I know this sounds like cheat code, but the, the Vaishnava belief is they're not really participating in karma. That they're just under the shelter of Vishnu. And uh, whatever karma is there, they're not interested in. Um, whether they go to liberation or they remain bound in the material world. They're just trying to increase their devotion to Vishnu. So by chanting, there's a belief that by chanting, I mean, this is where it says everywhere, actually, in the Shastra, that taking the name of the Lord once, even once, in any condition of mind, that one is freed from all their karma. Of course, the second you stop chanting the name of the Lord, then your karma just starts ramping up like super fast right away. So that's why Vaishnavas are always chanting. Um, actually, so that's kind of an external reason, Bhutakal, Bhutakali, 
Uh, Kali, I guess you could try to sexualize her. It's more violent. It's a violent energy. Someone here is putting puta. I'm just, I'm just like spitballing here, uh, Andreas. You got anything, buddy? I just saw this comment. What do you think of this? Sri Vishnu as Mohini allows Rahu. Correct. Rahu is illusion. Yes. Primary cause of rebirth and continuation of life. I don't know about that. Uh, primary cause of continuing samsara is, you know, many factors. <laughs> There's not a single cause. Uh, generally, what do, you think of the huh? what do you think of the factors? Oh, there's so many factors. There's uh, Kalapatradesha, there's time, place, circumstance, there's the ingredients, the karna, the senses. There is daivam, there's providence, right? There's uh, one's effort, y uh, yatna, right? There's so many factors involved in overcoming karma. You know, it's your body, your mind, your senses, your, your spirit, all of those things, your agency, all those things are um, to be accounted for. So it's not like, um, so that actually that's one of the secrets of bhakti or Vaishnavism is that when you realize there's so many things to account for, then you, this is actually not so far off of the, this is where you could actually make connections uh, with Christianity and things like that, is that um, you're getting help from uh, God, right? So if, if you have so much complex situation where you're getting reborn, you know, with uh, all these desires, uh, one thing you can do is, uh, is appeal to the Lord as a thief to steal away your desires. That's why he's called Hari. Hari means thief, actually. <laughs> so we call God as thief, and that's actually our hope, that he will actually steal away our materiality because we're not very eager to get it, give it up, even if we know it's not good for us. You know, remaining in samsara is not good for us, but if the Lord is a thief, then he can come and steal it, steal all our material desires away, or fulfill our desire in such a way that we never ask for it again, or or um, just override everything. So that it's there is like a dependency, or what's called sheshatwa, is essentially a dependency on the Lord um, for all things. So this is like a different uh, system. It's not actually a new system. It's very old. It goes back to the tantra. Really, this is like tantra is like secret practices. Like how can you like hack karma? Like one of them is to bring the Lord onto your side, bring the Lord under control. That's called Vashikaran in, in black magic. So, there, you know, uh, Tantra has some sorcery that they can do. One of them is to control another person. That's called Vashikaran. So, like, you can kill a person with mantras. That's called Marana. Uh, you can stupef stupefy a person. That's called Stamba. Right? There's all kinds of things you could do to injure another person. One of them is to bring them under your control. That's called Vashikaran. So if you're going to use Vashikaran on God, like how do you bring God under control? You can't, except through uh, love, right? He doesn't really need it, but uh, it's kind of hard to dislike somebody who likes you. You know what I mean? Like you're, everybody's got that friend. You're like, oh man, I wish this guy didn't like me. <laughs> this, you can't, you're like bound to that person. You like can't get rid of them. You're like, oh well, he's, I'm bound to this person. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, uh, no, Bhakti actually goes back to Tantra, um, like bringing the Ishwara under your, on your side, you know? Vishnu is also very easy, easy to please. Um, but, but Vaishnavism is like, I wouldn't, it's kind of like orthodox, Vedic Tantra. It's it, what it combines is both the Veda and the Tantra. The, the Tantra and the Veda aren't necessarily separate, but the Tantra are like the secret practices of the Veda. So, and Tantra doesn't mean sex. What Tantra means is um, to weave together matter and spirit into a unity. It's a non-dual, it's a non-dual um, consciousness where matter is just the radical eminence of spirit. So, spirit is just pose. It's just pretending to be matter. Like everything you see around you is consciousness. But you're, and it's it's also one with you. But you're uh, feeling I am separate. I am independent. This all comes from this ahamkara or agency, where you are thinking I am controller of everything around me, and I these are my friends, my money, my power. This is how old I am. I am I have a human body. This is an animal. You know I'm superior. They're inferior. This is all duality. So overcoming that is part of overcoming material consciousness. You know. So, so why does it help to fast and eat healthy and not? murder you know like what do those things do for your soul and why does it help to like love vishnu or like love the source and focus on 
being like well, that's God. a secret teaching loving god is actually a great secret but most people are not actually loving god they're trying to get something yeah <laughs> they're actually business dealings with god that's not actually loving god uh so so, right. so all those when different you love god like you focus on like perfect i don't know that's your this is your job to answer sorry oh wait don't you no no i i i can i'll never run out of answers for these things what, what are you what are you saying what do you want to talk about i was just thinking about like driving through the america then you see like um these like you know the this secular world of like trailer parks and people that have lost divine principles of geometry and the golden ratio because they're not trying to emulate god because they're not loving god you know it's not necessarily even about the benefit to them be going to heaven or something like that it's just like you can see it if someone like makes a garden and they love God, you know, like you can all of a sudden focus on form and shape and divine principles in emerge. general, in general, but to detect who's actually a devotee of God, uh, it says even Lord Shiva has difficulty figuring out who is a Vaishnava, who is a devotee. Yeah. Vaishnava means worship prohibition. Who is, and here you can, you, you could stand in your own Ishtadeva, you know, who is actually devotee, uh, of God, if you want to use, we're using English words here. So I would love to talk in Sanskrit. We're just using English words here. Um, so it's not easy to tell. There's a story where there was a butcher, and the butcher had on this uh, what's called a shila. It's like a magic stone, but it's actually like an avatar of Vishnu. They, they're in Nepal, like in the Gandaki River. They're actually like these uh, ancient, um, what do you call fossils that have these spirals? Um, they they carve the rock, you know, and they're like yeah, it's like Nautilus. Have you seen yeah. those? Have you seen those Shilas, Shalagram? Maybe you, you know Kathmandu. They you're not supposed to sell them, but if you go in the or buy them, but when you go in the the river, you can like dig them up. Sometimes I found one there. But um, he a butcher was using this form of Vishnu as a weight <laughs> to like weigh meat, and then some Brahmana came by, who's like you know a priest came by and said, "Oh God, what are you doing, butcher man? You're making big offense here." To the Vishnu, you put him as a you're using him as a weight for your your butchery. Uh, I will buy him from you from a great price here. Take this money. Just give me oh butcher butcher is like oh, okay. So Vishnu went with him with the Brahmana, and that night he couldn't sleep and he had a dream of Vishnu. Vishnu said, "Why did you take me away from my devotee, the butcher?" It's like what? <laughs> like he's like, what wow. do you mean, my lord? I'm confused. Your your uh, knowledge and illusion confuse even sages so what to speak of me just a priest you know even sages are confused even gods are put into confusion by you by you even brahma is confused by you you know if you wish to be with the butcher then how can i tell you what's right and wrong so he takes him back <laughs> to the butcher and, and he says that was my swing in the dream he tells him i was swinging on the, the scale of meat and uh so meat is like very taboo for vaishnava <laughs> you know we don't eat meat uh, that's so like of all the people who in India, Vaishnavas are always vegetarian. They're never non-veg. Like if somebody's like eating meat, they're like, no, not Vaishnav. Sorry. You know, uh, you can almost like break every rule except for that. Um, but, uh, you know, they're like, uh, what is it called? So it's like for him, it's like big taboo. But Narayan, right, the shelter of all people say, Hey, he's my devotee. I want to be on that scale of meat <laughs> and swing back and forth. And he is my devotee and he is doing my service there. So the Brahmana can understand who is this butcher. It's like very out of the ordinary. So we can't always tell, you know, you see someone in a trailer park. We don't know what devotion is in their heart. We don't know what kind of devotion they have to God. It's not easy. It's very hard to tell, actually, who is what. I mean, there's a lot of external things like... Like if I went to look for a guru, I would look for certain qualities. I wouldn't just go like, oh, here's a drunk. Let me surrender to him. Like, <laughs> like Standard practice. Like don't make the exceptional rule. I'm telling some exceptional story. But I'm just giving an example why it's not always easy to tell. Just like trailer trailer park people could be great devotees. Nobody knows, right? You know, but yeah, so I, mean, I guess it's some question you get to ask what is um, the, I mean, because it's not about the benefit, but like, you know, the signs, like why is it, right to focus on vishnu why vishnu oh his portfolio I mean, dude you, you 
if you look at Vishnu's portfolio, you'll be like, what? Like, this is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> he's got the most awesome portfolio. Like, if you're going to pick a god, if let's say you're like, okay, one of these cats is god, who is it? And you start looking at everybody's portfolio, and then you see, like, Vishnu's portfolio, you just be like, jeez. Like, it's it's so stacked. It's so stacked. Like, <laughs> like you can worship him through anger. Like, if you don't like him, he accepts that as worship. He doesn't get upset about it. You can worship him through uh, through love. You can worship him as uh, in any, like, if somebody, like, I don't I just can't accept this, like, jealous God thing. I'm sorry. Like, the God's not, like, jealous. You're talking about, like, it's like saying, like, a parent's jealous of their child. I mean, I'm sure there's some bad parents who are jealous of their children, but that's, like, so bananas, you know? So, uh <laughs> Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, if anyone worships another god, uh, I make their faith strong in that god. That's what he says. Is I make their faith strong in that god, even though in reality it is only an aspect of me. They're worshiping me. And all men follow my path in all respects. Think about it. What's more merciful than that? So people talk about mercy, like, oh, I'm going, you, you know, that's the problem, man. If Christians can fix that theodicy thing, like, how are you going to get the theodicy off the ground? Like, the, sorry, guys, theodicy means problem of evil. How do you fix this if you're going to hell forever for, like, limited infraction? Like, let's say Hitler. Let's say, just assume that everything, you know, he's just, you know, he's the worst guy. Assume he's going to hell. It's pretty easy to assume. Then, even if you, like, calculated it all, then it would still be a limited amount of evil. Even though it, it, it appears that inc incalculable evil, it still like has some finite. So he'll go to hell forever. So it's if you try to understand forever or infinite, it's like, this is not, uh, it's not something that we can really comprehend. So it just seems like, why would there be like infinite punishment for limited infraction? But she doesn't do any of that nonsense. So like, there's no, right. there's nothing in the, in the, in the Vedas that's like, Telling he tells people to do foolish things like kill your son or you know there's none of that none of that it's all like very straightforward like one who worships the ancestors goes to the ancestors one who worships the gods goes to the gods one who worships the ghosts goes to the ghosts and one who worships me comes to me you know there's it's all very plain you know it's simple but Vishnu's Vishnu's profile is so stacked you know I mean like his demon slaying once once Vishnu killed all the politicians on the earth 21 times in a row. He was so pissed off. <laughs> who who can claim that? So when when you get into these like magical claims, who who can say they got so pissed off with the politicians that they just slaughtered them all twenty one times? So I mean, so there's like they're just so like the profile is so stacked. Once he once he there was a witch tried to poison him as a baby. He accepted her breast and sucked her life out through the breast. But he accepted <laughs> her as a mother and he gave her liberation from samsara. So even if you try to kill him, he'll bless you. Like he doesn't get upset. <laughs> Nobody's got that profile. That like no matter what, he just like helps you. Here, be good, son. Be good. It was the most logical thing. Also, like why would you care? You know, this idea well, this God is going to care about this is like actions of this imbecile. These like characters that are just stands in time. Like why would it be so upset? You right. know, yeah. This idea of hell. You know, but this is also interesting. Like Mormons and a lot of different groups that have tried to move away from hell this is closer to the veda like you go to where you plan to go if you're focused on devastation then you could probably create a narayana i mean do you, you think can of go, you can go to hell if you want to but it's just like right. you don't have to stay there forever you know yeah so like, what are you what's the deal with that hell, but like it's not permanent you can change and get out you know yeah what's the deal with the narayanas and these uh you know samsaras Narayana. Narayana is one. So when you see Vishnu appearing in many forms, he's still this, he's all in one. It's his Maya, his magic that's making him look like he's appearing in all places. He is in all places, but he's in the same place. He is still so, there. He is situated you, in one place. Is there an, so there's kind of like the worst thing I can think of, maybe in terms of like hell, is like being disconnected from Narayana. Like, can you be as far away from Narayana as possible? Yeah, that's like a high theological abstract interpretation. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say hell. that's also like that's also like Dante, right? Like Dante, what's hell? It's like a frozen yeah. place where you're like so far from God. I think that's pretty spot on. I I, I would I would subscribe to that view. You know, hmm. to me, like hell is not material suffering, but being separated from from Krishna. Not like, you know, 
what is you know, material suffering? I, I'm a nurse, man. I see like the worst material suffering. Um, and then there's psychological suffering. It's also really bad. You know, uh, losing a child is probably one of the worst, you know, um, these things are all, these things are all of this plane, but like, why should one have to endure such pain infinitely? I just can't accept. Why, why does this soul, the souls were created to suffer like Calvinism. Like these guys are like created to die. It's like, go and go there. I sent, I create you, you go there. Now the so Vaishnava is, yeah. It, like I said, it also makes sense from like the celestial bureaucracy idea that there's like um, degrees of glory instead of heaven and hell. Because people are always like, oh man, there should be hell. It's like, no, I don't know why there has to be hell. Like this is already pretty bad. You know, if you stop it, then you should be able to have levels of closeness to the source. And do you see that as like part of Hinduism or Vishnu? Yeah, Vaishnav? like well, there's yeah, there's greater degrees of intimacy. You know, like going to the kingdom of God. This is exactly. also a byproduct. Even being in close proximity of of God is a byproduct. Like, oh, I'm very close. I'm sitting near His right hand. Right nearby even that's a like a byproduct it's something that he gives us but like what are we going to give the concern of the vaishnava the wish worshiper of vishnu is not what vishnu is going to give me it's like can i figure out like what can i give him you know that's the trick god he doesn't need so if you can figure out a way to actually serve vishnu or serve his servants essentially that's the thing because his servants don't want anything so from him so if you could figure out somehow to serve the servants, this is actually one of like the secrets. Um, this also goes back to the guru, shishya, the student and teacher thing. Uh, but yeah, like God doesn't need anything. Uh, and he has difficulty serving his servants. Like his true servants won't really won't accept any benedictions or blessings from him. They're just like, oh Lord, have I done something wrong? That's why you think I have material desires. So you're trying to give me material things. Like, I'm sorry, I, maybe I thought for a second something, but I can't remember that I wanted some material thing. Uh, please don't ask to give me something. I'm not here. This is the backwards relationship. I'm trying to give you something. And then he's like, ah, what can I do these Vaishnavas? I can't give them anything. Even if I try to save them, they're like, oh, I'm already saved in your service, my Lord. <laughs> you want me to go to hell? Yes, I'll go to hell to preach. That's a different thing. You know, I will go relieve the condition and the suffering and the material consciousness. But so, yeah, there's like no profile like that, like no envy, no. Another example is there was a sage in the, in the Vedic pantheon called Brigu. And Brigu was a very clever guy. And so he went and he tested the gods. He first he went to Brahma and he's actually the son of Brahma and he didn't bow down to him. And he said, he said, my Lord, no, he came to his father and praised him and, and embraced his father, but he did not bow down to him. So he didn't follow the etiquette. And so he saw a little glint of anger in Brahma's eye, but Brahma controlled his senses and did not show the anger very much. But Brigu could detect it because he was a sage. He was a, he's a born, he's a son of the creator, you know, so he has mystic power, he can see. And then he went to his brother, Shiva, you know, who's also born from Brahma. He went to his brother, Shiva, and Shiva is very enthusiastic. And Shiva gets up, my brother, and he goes to embrace him, but he's the guy, ashes and snakes. And then Brigu goes, stop, brother, you're so dirty. Try to embrace me wearing ashes and snakes. I'll become dirty myself. And then Shiva gets very angry also. <laughs> he's like, pick up the trident to like slay him. You know, oh, what kind of brother are you? <laughs> like gonna slay him. And then uh Parvati intervenes and says, No, no, he's a sage, you're being tested. And then Shiva's like, Oh yes, you tested me very good, you win. You know? Uh then he goes to Vishnu, and Vishnu is lying down sleeping. Brigu goes and kicks him in the chest. And Vishnu goes, Oh, somebody woke me up. Oh, a sage is here. I'm so fortunate. And he starts to massage his feet. Oh. And he says, oh, my chest, the sages, other sages have said, my chest is as hard as a thunderbolt. But sages have very soft feet, and they're always in meditation. They are not used to hard work. So your soft feet kicked my hard chest, and you must have injured your toe. So let me clean your feet, because you're a guest. So like, then <laughs> your person, who is this Vishnu? Is so sweet, talking so sweetly to me. Even I did offense to him, and he's taking it as if he has offended me. Where is a God like that? That you that if you offend him, he will take it that he has offended you. Also, you can't hurt him. It's not like your offense did anything to him. It just bounced off. Like <laughs> there was one right. who tried to curse Vishnu at the end of the Mahabharat war, and he said, he said, Oh, all these soldiers have died and all their widows are remaining and crying. And he's like seeing like just like millions of widows, like, oh all the soldiers have died in this great battle. He says, Vishnu, Krishna, this is your fault. Because you're God and you could have prevented this. 
And he said, my dear Brahman, I will certainly fulfill, fulfill your desires, whatever it is. He says, I wish that your, your family will die like, like the families of all these widows. He says, oh, my family will die. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> and, then, and then he goes, but I warn you, are you sure you want this? Because everything that you want, I automatically want. So it like it doesn't it just like whatever you want to happen will happen. And then so he he allowed his whole family to get destroyed in in a big drunken brawl at a camp called Brabas. So he allowed this curse to take place. He allowed himself to be cursed. He accepted this curse as a type of worship. And then he warned the person that if you curse me, it doesn't it doesn't affect me. I'm nirguna. I'm outside of the three modes. I'm outside of sattva, rajas and tamas. I don't become affected by curses. They just enhance my play. They just increase the spice in my drama. They're just increasing <laughs> the spice in my drama by by throwing some chili powder in here, and so he accepts. He accepts a curse. So he accepts a curse as worship. So he even allowed his devotee to curse him. Then the devotee, goes, oh, what have I done? They curse the god, you know. Who 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 is so merciful that he will fulfill your? Another devotee wanted to kill him, and he allowed it. <laughs> so, what kind of? This is nothing. It just keeps going. Like if you start reading about Krishna, it just like it's so stacked. It's so stacked, like they're like the the feats of. One time he was a dwarf, right? <laughs> to save the gods, he became a midget, like a dwarf. You know where is this that God becomes a midget or a dwarf? Like even dwarves are not excluded. You're a dwarf. <laughs> I'm also a dwarf. You know, he little becomes, people are greatly underrepresented in in right in religious little literature. Are greatly. Yeah, I met a I met a dwarf devotee once. I was like, oh yeah. Nice dwarves. Dwarves are so. I, cool. I, 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 I'm glad you admit that. That's how I would feel too. I'm always stoked by phenomenological diversity. I'm like, yeah. Oh no, he, he he said he said he said he got brought to this because there was a god who's a dwarf. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's like, I found I found my representation in God. He became a <laughs> midget. He begged, he begged from the demon king three paces of land, and just seeing this this dwarf, this dwarf Brahmana, he said to him. He's the king of the underworld, and he said, "Oh, you know, you're no offense. You're very small, and you're very great, also. But if I only give you three paces of land, people will laugh at me. I'm the I'm the emperor, and if I only can give you, you can ask me for a whole kingdom. I'll give you. What what won't I give you? Ask me for anything." He says, "I only insist on three paces of land." Wow. And he says, "Okay." And then his guru, <laughs> his name's Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj tried to. He knew he knew it was Vishnu, and his guru warned him, no, 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 don't give him what he wants. This is Vishnu. He looks like a dwarf, but he's Vishnu. He's come to take your kingdom and give it back to the gods that you stole from them. The demon king was very powerful, but he was also a devotee, and he had stolen the kingdom from the gods. So that's the thing. Like in the in the Hindu thing, it's like the bad guys aren't completely bad. They're like still on the team. You know? <laughs> so it's like this play is going back and forth. I mean, what's more cool than that? And then so anyways, guru, like the guru of the demons goes, Shukra, he says, no, 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 don't give him anything. I forbid you. You're my disciple. I forbid you. And then he said, no, my guru, uh, even you're giving this wrong instruction, even though I respect you, I would rather uh, not do what you say and, and fear the curse of the guru, which is very powerful, very powerful type of curse, than to disrespect Vishnu here. And then he said, he said, okay. You will lose your kingdom. That was the curse. But it was already going to happen anyway because yeah. Vishnu shut up. Then what happens is Bali Maharaj goes to pour out the water to, to make to make his promise true as the king. He poured out the water. He washed his hands. And he, he like honored sacred prayers and bestowed three paces of land on Vishnu as Vamana, as the dwarf. And his guru tried to hide in the water pot to block the hole. And he poked his finger in there and he actually poked his guru's eye. Uh, so it was like a big offense but anyway uh so uh what happened then is um in the first step vamana stepped across the entire universe right and in his second step he pierced through beyond the universe into the spiritual world and crossed the entire spiritual world the second step and then he said to bali where will i place my third step since i have taken all of your land and all that land which you do not have right and then bali was very clever the Maharaji said my lord, please place your third step on my head. <laughs> <laughs> Vishnu put, bless him. Boom. And so all of that Vedic knowledge went into the mind of Bali when Vishnu placed his foot on his head. He temporarily lost his kingdom. He was arrested. 
And then after that, then he gave it back to him. <laughs> so yeah. he arrested. He took away the portion that belonged to the gods, gave it to the gods, and then he took Bali Marjah's kingdom and gave it back to him. So he didn't even Maybe punish him. Yeah. You see? So even as a midget, he does great acts. So it's just like he <laughs> became a turtle, he got a back massage in the ocean of milk. I mean, come on, who's got such a stacked profile? I swear. Look, tell me whose profile is so heavily stacked. Well, it's pretty it's an interesting idea that it, it's all really about Vishnu, right? Like Narayana is source, it is Vishnu, and everything is one. Anyway. It's not all about Vishnu. That Vishnu is actually kind of a secret in a way. Um, people think so because there's so much variety and there's so much um, permission. There's so much permission in the Dharma to find your way as you see fit. Um, the, the highest secret is Vishnu, uh, but, you know, and... and I think the most objection you're going to get is from followers of like Shiva or, or Shakti, but uh, there isn't really um, an objection because they're actually one. So Shiva and Vishnu are like two sides of the same coin. And even Shakti, she's called as Narayani in the most fundamental uh, scripture of the worshipers of Durga. She's Narayani, Narayani Namostate. So Narayani is another form of Vishnu. They're like, that's the thing which people can understand that God has a God. <laughs> like, so the, the relationship between Vishnu and Shiva is they like to bow down to each other. So like Vishnu is like <laughs> the God of Shiva and Shiva is like the God of Vishnu. So if you're a God, you can even have a God. So who is qualified to be the God of God? He decides. So Krishna's Ishta Devata is actually, is actually Shiva. So you don't look at it like Vishnu created Shiva or Shiva created Vishnu? You don't think of it like that? They are both eternal. So, so they're the created aspect. That's Brahma. Brahma comes out the navel of Vishnu. You could say Shiva comes out the third eye of Brahma. But actually there's a Shiva who exists before Brahma. So you would, you would put Shiva above Brahma, but still it's Shiva and Vishnu are kind of competitively one. eternals? One. Yeah. There, there was called Anyanyashraya. They are They're each all three one, aren't they? Or four? Mahadevi, yeah, Brahma, Shiva, and uh, Vishnu? They are one. Although I can make very strong arguments why Vishnu is, you know, the one that people, that even Shiva would direct people to. Yeah. You know what Shiva, so what's special about Shiva is that he's like the god of mystics, of yogis. Like for those, like adepts, not, not like, not, um, not like lightweight people. Like if you want to be serious meditator and you, you follow Shiva, you'll get very strong results. But um, it's a form of Vishnu also, you can say. Uh, many Shiva followers will not accept. But uh, even in the, even, you know, here's what's interesting though. In the books that glorify Shiva, you'll find all these glorifications of Vishnu. And in the books that glorify Vishnu, you'll find all these glorifications of Shiva. Actually, I named my son Harihara. Harihara means Shiva Vishnu. So, uh, yeah, like I said, the uh, Madhava and Umadava, the the wife of Lakshmi and the wife of Uma, like Uma Thurman. I mean, the husband of husband of Lakshmi and the husband of not like Uma Thurman. Uma, not like Uma Thurman. Beyond that, but no, you know, Uma Thurman is actually named after Uma. I believe she's that named after Durga. Yeah, her father named her after Durga. I hope she's a good person. I guess you know. I don't know if she is, but yeah, uh, she's actually named after. <laughs> she's, got, she's got personality in those Tarantino movies. I'll tell you that. But um, anyway, now, now I'm on like a, I'm on a tirade. Vaishnavism. Vaishnavism. What is that? Yeah. yeah what is the Vaishnava Dharma? It's a type of, it's a Dharma. Like Bauda Dharma, like Bo followers of Buddha. Bauda Dharma. Shaiva Dharma, followers of Shiva. The Dharma is like the structure, rhythm, like the order, the order, the cosmic order of Shiva, the cosmic order of Vishnu. So it's like a lens. These are like lens, you can say. Is it believed that from generation to generation, even if not, you know, just through reincarnation, but like your, the cycles of karma elevate and that you should have closeness, you should have more intimacy with God or with source, or are you ending, if you're an untouchable, should your um, cycles just be untouchable forever? Or is that like a thing or is that just like so Portuguese caste system? It's not. It's not, uh, that's not the way. So um, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Chatur Varna Mayashristam Guna Karma Vibhagasha. He says, uh, Chatur, Chatur means four Varnas. There's four Varnas. They should really be thought of as guilds. They're not fixed. Chatur Varna Maya means by me, Shristam. They're created by me. 
Guna karma means qualities and actions. Vibhagasha, they're divided by qualities and actions. It doesn't say by birth. So it's not a doctrinal point that one has to be like born successively in higher uh, varnas. I mean, though, like if you go back in time, generally people did what their father did. You know, like you just, I mean, you can change your guild, but it takes more work. There are instances in the in the Shastra, in the scriptures, in the Vedas that uh, show people changing their varna. I mean, like Vishramrita Mitra was a, uh, a warrior who wanted to become a Brahmana, and it took him a lot of work, but he became a Brahmana. You know, so the untouchability thing. This thing is most almost died out. You know, uh, I think a lot of it goes back to biohazard and like superstition, like oh, somebody's like cleaning the the sewers or the gutter like maybe you'll get sick if you touch them or like you don't want that to be like coming into the um where the sacrifice is taking place because sacrifices to gods need to be clean you know maybe if the person took a bath or could clean up somehow although it's very hard you know like with the biohazard thing um, i know that's kind of a modern interpretation but the idea of untouchability is Mostly gone away. Interesting, though, that Gandhi called them Harijana. Harijana is another word for Vaishnava. Harijana, a person of Hari. The untouchables were people of Hari. So he tried to give them very high status. Oh, these are Vaishnava. They are the servants of Vishnu. So you should not disrespect them because disrespecting a Vaishnava is considered to be dangerous. You know, because they won't take offense, but uh, Vishnu will take. Uh, so yeah, untouchable. That's not how it works. So like you you don't you don't only go forward, and you don't go forward materially. You go forward spiritually. It's not like oh I did some good karma. So you actually can't escape samsara through karma. And since varnashram, it's called varnashram dharma, where you have four castes. Caste is actually a Portuguese concept. It's kind of like more racial. Like you have mulattoes and uh, mestizos and amerindios or whatever. <laughs> You know, it, that's like a racist kind of interpretation of, of uh, social hierarchy. That's not Varna at all. Varna's guild. Since the Brahmanas were the learned, you know, the society pre prized knowledge, you know. Their, their sporting events were debates that people would argue. The gurus would come with their disciples, they would argue, and then one guru would have to surrender to the other when they lost the debate. So, yeah, Jati is not, it's not doctrinally, um, at least from like a Shastric standpoint, it's not, a, it's immaterial. Your jati, like I'm not even, I'm not even in the, I'm antyaja. I wouldn't even fit into their thing because I'm not even born in the culture. But you know, by learning Sanskrit and by studying all the traditions, like, no, I've never been disrespected like that as a, like an outsider. And mm -hmm. I don't even hear people. I never really hear people using the word untouchable, like a chute or something. Like I'd never heard this. Like I lived in India for years, never heard anybody saying a chute. Maybe I just kept good company and I didn't hang out with like low class, like racist people, but like. Uh, it's a billion people, I'm sure it's possible, but yeah, you get the point. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, no, I'm sure. Like, I think there's really people back in the villages and stuff. Like, some people, it's not socially there. encouraged, but yeah, 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 it's been pretty stamped out pretty hard. There's a lot of like anti um, what do you call it discrimination measures in India. It's a start. What about Smarta? What do you feel about that? Smarta, Smarta is a uh, what do you call it? It's a tradition that's the Brahminical tradition. Um, they worship usually these five uh, forms. Um, but the word smarta comes from smrita, from the smriti. What's that shop. called again, the five forms, that word? Uh, was it the pancha upashana? They do uh, worship these five pancha. They worship the five. You know, you have Vishnu and Shiva and Shakti and Ganesh, and I believe Surya. Yeah, like pancha Buddha. So like that's interesting to me because it's like five elements, five forms. Is is there a connection you think between alchemy and science? I mean, earth, air, wind, water, right here with the pancha Buddha. Is there? Do you tie the five forms to the elements, or is that not really correct? Uh, you know, I'm not an expert in smarta, but I don't think that that is the, the technically correct thing. The five elements come from what's called shunkya. Shankya means to count. Uh, Shankya is very old. So it's one of the six Indian schools of philosophical, of metaphysics. So there's six Indian schools of metaphysics. One of them is called Shankya. And the five elements, like you've described, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, those five are um, described in the school of Shankya. And those five are thought to generate the organs 
How do I spell Shankya? S A S A M K H Y A. Samkya. Okay. Samkya is very old. Nobody knows how old this thing is. Um, there are not that many surviving texts of this school, but everybody uses their metaphysics. It's more of a metaphysics of like consciousness. So I can describe you Shankya Yoga really quick. There's five yeah. elements like you've described. There's five set. There's five knowledge organs. Those are called Gyan Indriya. That means your five senses, right? So the senses are thought as, of as knowledge organs. So they give you information. They're in, inflowing. And then your five outgoing senses are the five karma indriyas. They create karmas. That's speech, uh, hands, legs. You walk around. Uh, you can evacuate stool and urine, uh, semen, vaginal fluid. Uh, and generation, of course. Generation, you can create a new being. So those are your five karmas. You can speak. You can do stuff with your hands. You can walk. You know, uh, locomotion right you can pass tool and urine you can generate a new being with sexual fluid so um those are your five organs of karma five organs of knowledge five organs of karma five elements and then five sense objects those are called tanmatra tanmatra means that which is measured five things being measured um, that means your organ of taste your organ of smell your organ of sight your organ of sound your organ of touch touching your skin right these are um, or the, the thing that's being measured, not the organ, excuse me, the sense. So like smells, odors, flavors, sensations, forms, right? And sounds, right? And then you have four subtle elements that's called your, so you have the, that's the external body. That's your material external body. Are those the guna? The three gunas. Is that that's different? Even, that's even higher. That's so we're getting there. We're almost there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I know. <laughs> I, I just didn't fucking ramble at you, man. Sorry. <laughs> punishing you man that's your fault for bringing me on man just kidding <laughs> so so the uh then you have so your you have a body made of food right and your food body is where you have your organs your sense objects right those things the elements are in the food body right then you have a mental body that consists of mind intelligence ego and like something like kant's emmanuel kant's transcendental life perception called chitta it's like cognitive process emmanuel really was a never mind keep going so okay so there's manas mind right buddhi like mana mana right? you know maybe you're familiar with that remember that game secrets of mana back in the day uh, mana buddhi ahankara ahankara is more like so the indian ego is more like an agency and agency means doership so because that's connected to karma so that your ego is actually the thing the ahankara is the thing that's getting you entangled in karma right that I am the doer, I am the doer, you know, that makes your false identity, right? And then chitta is like where all your bhava, your emotions, and your smriti, your memories are stored. And all of these 24 elements constitute samkhya, right? And the yoga of samkhya is to discriminate these. I was going to tell Stefan, Dr. Shiva will be here on the 16th. We actually are having Dr. Shiva on. Who is Dr. Sorry. Shiva? He's a uh, the dude. He's an Indian dude who uh, patented email, electronic mail, back in the 1968 or something like that. And yeah, it's pretty sweet. And he's uh, uh, running for some sort of political. He's running for president, but I don't remember which party. I think Libertarian it was one of those things earlier I was talking about. But he's a Hindu. Right. Yeah. How about that. All right. But sorry, man is booty, chita, amakara, the ego, consciousness, yeah. mind. Amakara, right. like karma, like kriya, like, kri, like your hand, right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing, I'm the doer. So the Indian ego is very much entangled with karma. That is the agency. I'm the agent. I'm the doer of this action, right? And because I identify as the doer, I have to enjoy and suffer the results, the reaction, right? So the, the problem in this whole system of Shankya is that your ahankara is overriding your buddhi. Your intelligence and it's making you to get entangled and identify with your actions and with the the five elements the the organs uh, all those things and what you have to do is use your intellect to control your mind to surpass your ahankara and uh bring your chitta into consciousness of ishwara <laughs> i know it's just like very technical but uh yeah you're using you well, I mean, use your uh, would you use these english words or is that not good you should use your um how, what, These are all the very word? loaded. Yeah, you can start with this. It's fine. It's fine. You can start with that. But yeah, they get very technical. Like, far right. How do I spell that? What? You said to from um, Amkara to Ashwara. Did you say Ashwara? Ishwara? 
Ishwara. Ishwara is the self of the self. This is God. Vishnu, Shiva, Ishwari, Shakti. Right. Ishvara, Ishvara. Right. Ishwaras. Even the gods could be called Ishwaras. They have Ishwara means one who can, one whose desires like become like they control. They're controllers. They have okay, so like a dominant mood and personality of the existence. Yeah, they're like they're they have dominion over certain things. Like like uh, Ishwara of fire is Agni. He is like the predominating deity of fire, right? Or Indra. He is the predominating deity of weather and of the sense organs and you know, the king of the gods like that brahma is the predominating deity ishwara you know so all of the gods could be called ishwaras but like ishwara with a capital i like the supreme god so like the ishwaras like the the devas the uh the gods are like organs on the bo body they're organs of the body of god so like god has all functions so all the functions are there you could even consider the asuras like the demons to be a uh, demonic function like lust and greed and hatred these are also like functions universal functions but also kind of like ishvara is like, like the personal deity so like your own personal ishvara your own personal ishvara yep ishvara. you got it man you know this stuff <laughs> yeah right, right? I mean, it's like, like you like pretend that you don't know but you actually know. you're a good you're a good interviewer you're, you're gracious <laughs> Throw me the I feel like I feel like there is though there's some truth to this idea that you have this idea. I mean, this sounds like apotheosis to an extent as well. You've got the manifestation of the final form or the most correct form of that existence. So, does that mean that Narayana or Vishnu is the Ishvara of existence, like the final form or the most the form with the most dominion? So, when you're talking about hierarchy you're talking like the sanskrit word there would be taratamya means better best you're talking about like when you know it's actually in a considered an offense um to the name of hari to the name of vishnu to see a difference between him and shiva so uh if a vaishnava does that he's actually damaging his spiritual practice so for me to say no, I would say Vishnu is the Param Param. Actually, the Veda says Om Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam. Vishnu Om is that. That is Vishnu. And Vishnu is Param, Supreme. Padam means Padam is a very untranslatable word. It means like foot. So <laughs> Shiva might be the Ishvara of Vishnu in a sense. Uh, yeah, I said that earlier. So Vishnu has a god that is Shiva, but Shiva has a god that is Vishnu. So even God has a god. But this, there's like a relationship between Shiva and Vishnu, which is that they like to bow down to each other. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, sometimes you'll so hear the great the whole argument of hierarchy. You can't, you can't use the this hierarchy. This is a different system. This system is very different. So like, you know, like you try to go in the Western system, like, well, who is the God of God? And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? Get the hell out of here. Excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to get you taken down? I'm a blue collar worker, man. I'm a nurse. So we're in a hospital. <laughs> and like the junkies and all that stuff you know no you're fine i think okay. it's interesting i like that i like the because i mean but that's different though because the question still arises then like if there's no hierarchy are this the same person or are they literally equal parts or are they just part of the you know the dynamic that's necessary for like a body like there has to be parts of a body or well so if i want to start if i want to start saying that you could do a classification um not on ontology but on flavor i could start to make a very strong case for krishna and vishnu because um shiva's usually is like just in meditation he's like exemplar guru so at least the way the Vaishnavas see Shiva is he is like the bodily luster of the Lord, which is also the Lord. It's like and a final is, form that requires the core. He is he is like the buffer between matter and spirit. He is God facing the material world. So he's like the father of when God's ready, like when God's like worked out and done gone through the battle training montage, that's Shiva. He's also in a way like the generative organ of God. He is like the he is the giver of the seed. Like he, Vishnu is like the seed or the seminal principle, and he is like the 
the uh, giver of the seed. So also, I tie to puberty. This idea of like this is God as an adult. This is the final form of God or something. Well, well, Vishnu is always appearing young. So these like forever young. So like I don't know why people are always like God, old man, white beard. Like what the no, hell? not like that, but like puberty. Like he doesn't is Shiva. Well, I've seen Shiva as a child, but usually I see Shiva as like thirteen to seventeen. Right, right. So this is called Kaishora. Kaishora. So there's three. So when you write when you write dramas in poetry, they rank like these ages as like having more and more flavor. So like baby has a certain flavor for the parents, for older people than like relish the baby and it's cooing and like it's sticking its tongue out, trying to get some milk and like it's little pumping its arms and hands, you know how babies are. And uh, you know, they relish uh that but then that is a kind of a limited flavor that, that but when the child starts to develop more this is called bala they have like childhood behaviors are like sometimes naughty sometimes they cry and sometimes they make you laugh and say kind of silly things you know like what did my son say that was so funny he's like just you know he said to me i guess he's listening to me he's like just you know father that i am not dehydrated <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Okay, my son, I'm glad that you're not dehydrated. He's like, Setting oh, goals, bro. Just you know. Goals. I like the one you told me. He said, he's, your son told you, um, how can I get what I want without doing what you ask of me, father? Yeah, he said that when he was four. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> it's really hard to uh, try to uh, keep up with him. And it's just, it was <laughs> yeah, I have to treat him well. He can't, he can't pull fast on him. But okay, but, so there's this idea of like the, the third uh, one, the Kaishora, 13 to 17. Kaishora. Yeah, I'm sorry, these long answers. I'm giving you the technical. No, 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 no. I'm just trying to like pull up the images. Kaishora. I'm just trying to be, give you reliable information. Do you know, do you know that the difficulty <laughs> is not in understanding his newism? It's in getting reliable information because there's so much wrong information. That's actually the difficulty. Hinduism is not actually the ideas, like they're not that difficult to understand. But the. There's just so much like misconception that makes it almost impossible to like sort through it. Um, so the Kaishora age, that youthful age, that teenage, that's when your senses are the strongest. Your passion is the strongest, you know. You're ro most ready for romance, you know, like you're like you're going out like, you know. Well, what about the scary people, form? Going out to meet each other and sneaking away from their parents and stuff. What's this? This age? The scary this form. form. This form of Shiva, Agora. Yeah, Horrible, the, terrifying, yeah. the terrifying. So, 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 in all the deities, have you ever read Tibetan Book of the Dead? Are you familiar with that text? Indeed. Yes. 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 You know they call. One time, I remember in third grade, grade, I had to print out the, the Santa Cruz Public Library, and there was a storm, and I was like, I need for my book report the Book of the Dead, so I was going to print it out. I'm like, you shouldn't print out like a hundred, three hundred pages. I'm like, it's all right. And then there was like a lightning bolt, and the entire library went out, and I only got like thirty three pages printed of it. I'll never forget that day. Mm, 33 so uh so uh yeah it's interesting, it's interesting. Agora, the agora the agora you follow the agora right this is so funny uh did you ever see that like cnn like guy like he's like a chump like what's his name reza aslan or something <laughs> he tried to like become a disciple of like the agori baba and like the baba like threw urine on him <laughs> so like there's these Peaceful and wrathful forms of the deity. So it's more of a tantric. Oh thing. man, they did, didn't they? <laughs> That's That's straight up, those are straight up human remains. They put this on him and he got freaked out. This Baba told him, Shut up, you talk too much when he was freaking out. He said, I'll cut yeah. your head off if you don't shut up. And then he got really Whoa. scared. And then, then he wouldn't go away. So the Baba peed into his hand and threw it at him. And the look at <laughs> look at this guy is like <laughs> oh, yeah I'm so he was trying to what the, the thing is though that this guy was kind of a, trying to make a mockery of hinduism that was the problem and i think the baba sensed it that this guy's playing games and uh the baba went along with it and just kept testing him like well, how much can you tolerate like he freaked out when he put like the human human jaw bones like on his head and he's like eating them okay so that's like a non-dual practice that's very very tough type of practitioner. I would avoid them. They're actually powerful sorcerers. <laughs> I would avoid those people. Um, why am I saying? So the Ugra form, the terrifying form of Shiva. And then there's an Anugra form. means not terrifying. means means pleasant form. So when you read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, why I brought that up. Peaceful and wrathful deities. 
which is originally, according to the Dalai Lama, he, I think, wrote in the introduction of a recent translation, like well, maybe 10 years ago or so. He wrote that the original title is the Guya Garbha Tantra. Guya means hidden, Garbha is womb tantra. The Guya Garbha Tantra, the hidden womb tantra. And then he calls it uh, the peace, illumination by the peaceful and wrathful deities. And the Sanskrit for that would be Ugra and Anugra. So Ugra means ugly, like terrifying. Just think ugly when you hear Ugra. And uh, Anugra means not ugly, like not terrifying. So Shiva has a terrifying form and a not terrifying form. And sometimes the tantrics, usually not married, not family life, no family. Because if you worship an Ugra Deva, you worship like a difficult form of the deity, uh, you're playing with fire, you know, it's high stakes, you know, you get other people, like sometimes the deity will just like maybe remove you from your family, like maybe your family will die or like you will, you will just be ejected or rejected by them or like some mistake will happen that's confused and you get outcast, like, like you're, yeah, worshiping an Ugra Deva, I know somebody who was doing and they just ended up like getting ripped out of this relationship and just like, put over in another place, you know, I mean, it's, it's beneficial, it's just painful. The, the, the worshiping an Ugra deity in Tantra uh, is is dangerous because it's dangerous to your material desires. It will destroy your material. It's accelerating you towards moksha, towards liberation. So Again, with the medieval Christians and their Ugra, you know, this idea of like a violent uh, Christianity that emerged for a period of time. It seems like no matter where you go, you find examples of this happening again, even though it starts out earlier in India or, you know. No, I, w I would, I would, in this case, say that more work needs to be done on the concept because, in this case, the Ugra form is extraordinarily merciful. It's just that it's not merciful to your material ego. It's ripping you out of a lower spiritual level and shoving you up into a higher spiritual level. So you're, it's like, oh, you want to make spiritual advancement faster at any cost, and you approach the angry form of the deity. Then the angry form of the deity actually is even more merciful, but that mercy appears violent, like you're being corrected. You're being like readjusted, like violent readjustment. Like you're in the wrong space. You should actually be up here with these guys, you know, <laughs> like you're get out of the lower level, get into the higher level, like force you, like boom, take you up, put you over here. And that That's can be hard. You, it's harsh, man. You got to be like, if you're really tough and you keep doing that over and over, you'll make like, you'll cross so many worlds and save yourself so many lifetimes. However, I mean, like, it's painful, man. That's not, it's like a rough road, bro. And it may not be necessary, to be frank. Because why is it necessary to suffer to make advancement when it could just be a matter of knowledge and ignorance sometimes? You know, you're just in waddling in misconception. And also, Are you, you a tourist or something? What's your deal? You want to just, like, take the slow, steady course? You don't want to just... Uh... Me? <laughs> we can just, talk just about it. Steady, uh, steady bliss, you know. No, it doesn't feel like bliss. You may even go through periods of madness worshiping an Ugra Deva. It will be like danger, man. You could uh, even go back. No, I mean, like to avoid that, you know. But like realistically, if they're demanding that you go to a higher level, like why shouldn't everyone? Isn't that like Pauline Catholicism? You, everyone you may not be able to realize that you're going into a higher level, and maybe you shouldn't. Like maybe let's say let's say this: you get forced into a higher level, and then you offend some sage, and then you get thrown back a couple levels. What if you go forward mm -hmm. two and step back three? Right. When you don't even have to. <laughs> yeah. Just getting over cold here. Yeah, you see, it's complicated, but there's a there is a rationality in What's in good? the Hindu system, but it's it's not like you gotta be a genius to understand it. It's just there's like not good information. I, I think I think you follow everything, like it makes sense. Like not I'm not saying you have to believe in this, but I'm just saying like the system itself has its own internal logic. Right. Vaishnavism, we didn't really get to, but I, I said a couple things like it's a trans. I, I like to title something and then we never quite can get to the. It's fine. Do you want to try like we got at least another 15 minutes or 10 minutes or so. Try you another try. time. Yeah, okay. you, I want to hear you talk. What do you, what do you think? I just like spewed at you. Bro. What, what's no, your... I mean, this is all important. I think it's just interesting because to me, there is a. Um, like esoteric more gnostic understanding in the west that is identical or very close to identical and would be willing to sacrifice a lot of its own uh presuppositions in order to align itself closer 
and be more identical and harmonized with the Veda. So, I mean, it's interesting because there, I see where you're coming from that a lot of people in America are like, whoa, multiple God. Like, it seems weird to, to, I can see how it could seem weird to somebody, but I just, I'm so alien to normal normalcy. Like I'm so much more familiar with um, this idea and even just reading the Bible, like it talks about have no other gods before me. And there's like, I'm supposed to be this jealous God. We've been talking to people about the pre uh, first temple period. Then the first temple period, how they had Asherah, the wife of God, this kind of Mahadevi, and they erased and destroyed and cannibalized, literally cannibalized each other uh, to get rid of the first temple period. So I'm more and more interested in how there is like a pre-flood antediluvian harmonization between these things. And I'm aiming, I'm leaning towards Veda as the thing that has held on to the truth longer, you know, because there are definitely examples in the West of um, organizational secular manipulation of religion for the purpose of the state during the crusades into, you know, beyond that, like Theodosia, um, the, in 525 in, in Byzantium, the Byzantium period gets a lot of credit for saving Christianity. And in my opinion, it's like the thing that inverted Christianity. And I just, I keep seeing like, when I look at the life of Christ, I mean, I'm sorry, because I know we're talking about Hinduism, but it just, it really does sound to me a lot more like the Veda than it does like Judaism, you know? And I think that there, there's something about that. There's some point to bringing back um, living your life for a purpose and the consequences of that. And it's just also the idea that Vishnu is laughing at other people's attempts to step on him, you know, is just exactly like there. It, it's true. It's a stacked portfolio. Like you said, it's, you know, it gets, it gets more stacked. And here's another thing. One of the names identifiable and relatable. Check this out though, for mercy. When we're talking about mercy, what about this? One of, in the, there's a thousand names of Vishnu in this, uh, this, this section of the Mahabharat where Bhishma is lying on the bed of arrows. Like he's been pierced. He's a warrior who's invincible, but he's been pierced by a thousand arrows. And he's choosing to allow these arrows to kill him. He could just get back up with all those arrows. But he's like, no, this is the perfect time to die because Krishna is right here with me. So now I'm going to take my chance to die right in the presence of the Lord and surrender to him. And and, Vish and Krishna is literally just hanging out. <laughs> like he's, he's just like sitting like, and he's like listening to his devotee preach to him. He's just sitting and listening like, yes. He's so wise. Like, and he says in the thousand names of Vishnu, he calls him two names. One is Nimesha, he who blinks. And one is Animesha, he who does not blink. So he calls Krishna, you are the one who blinks. And you are the one who doesn't blink. The meaning of that is, if you commit any fault, he blinks. He doesn't even see it. Like if you did a sin or a fault, he doesn't even notice that. And uh, if, if you do any good action, any service, any devotion to him, or any good thing for others, he just his eyes are unblinking. So he refuses to see the faults of others. Actually, it's considered uh, there's like a list of good qualities that like a brahmana would have. One of them is uh, being averse to fault finding in others, not looking to see their bad quality. Like trying to see good on others is considered to be like a very pious quality, very difficult to achieve quality, but this is like an attainment. Like if you can attain this kind of consciousness where you're not finding fault on others all the time, like, just, you know, it's not really good style anyway. Um, then, um, you know, this is like a high thing. So he has that. He doesn't see the other's fault. Um, even, like, there was a thing where he let, <laughs> he let Shishupal insult him in the court in front of all the kings, a, a, a hundred insults before he had to kill him because everyone insisted. He's like, no, let him insult me. That's okay. He's, like, insulting, and you, Krishna, and you. And he's like, yes. <laughs> Yes, you're right. <laughs> and then it's funny because in Sanskrit, it's such a playful language. If you look at the Sanskrit, you can interpret each of one of those insults as a praise. And right. That's how course. he was taking it because the, the language is very uh, tricky. There's there's rules that you can do to every single letter in that language to manipulate it. Um, so it's as if the goddess of learning, Saraswati, had entered onto the tongue of the demon and is praising Krishna to the mouth of the demon. Krishna. Well, getting out what he's trying to say. He's yeah. just getting it out, man. He's getting it yeah. out. And he, he had that blessing from his mother, who was Krishna's friend. He says, please, if my son, he does, he's adverse to you, he doesn't like you, if he insults you, just tolerate at least 100 insults from him. And Krishna's like, definitely. <laughs> he actually, all the kings are like trying to draw their swords, and Krishna's like, no, do not draw your sword on this man. He has my blessings. 
<laughs> I know we're at the end. Concept. It goes even further. Yeah. It's one thing not to see the fault, but what about this? He enjoys the fault. So he enjoys the imperfections in people. Like, uh, you know, some people who are smarter than others, like, laugh at, like, the less intelligent. You know, whoever has some intelligence, if somebody's less intelligent and you, like, observe their vulgar activities, then you're, like, kind of, like, chuckling. Like, it's pretty funny, like, laughing at foolish people. But he actually enjoys the fault, just like a mother cow enjoys cleaning its calf, like, the dirt off its calf by licking it. So it's called dosha bogia. He is the one who enjoys the fault of his devotee. <laughs> Like a parent, you know, so like I just I just feel like this is like so much more like his portfolio is freaking impeccable, you know. It's like I don't see anything like, like he's a god, you know. Doesn't get anyway. Well, I want to ask you one last thing, but I don't know if you can answer it this time or if you just have to think about it forever <laughs> until next time. But I was I thinking about anything, in you know, Christianity you know. and Kabbalah and Hebrew, you know, in the they have the belief of the reincarnation, transmigration of the souls. There's plenty of evidence for reincarnation as being a major part of like Hebrew and ancient first temple period belief. And then there's this Mormon idea of there's no hell. There's pre-mortal existence. There's the karma period of earth life. There's this next period of spiritual world, which you have three degrees of intimacy closer to Vishnu. Does that sound right to you? Or is am I missing something? You just said a lot. Can you say more? <laughs> I mean, first off, the idea of reincarnation, totally compatible with Christianity because it's compatible sure. with for example, Hebrew and it's compatible with Kabbalah. Second is this is the model for Mormons. There's no heaven and hell, right? There's heaven, but heaven is just once you reach the spiritual world, how close you are to God. Like in terms of, you talked earlier, intimacy. Uh, levels of intimacy. There's three state like levels: celestial, terrestrial, in celestial. Mormon, terrestrial. In Mormonism, there's three. You're telling me I, I'm not. I don't know these things. Yeah. You're telling me in Mormonism, there's states of intimacy, close, getting closer to God. Correct. In an intimate way, like in a relationship sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And uh, then, if you really wanted to, you could experience outer darkness. I guess, which is like your choice. You'd have to like really want to not be part of. Um, source not be part of god but like it's not like necessarily judgment so much as like you chose not to be part of even like heaven at all let alone to be like close to god to be like next to god to be serving god at the center right you have to like avoid any indication of the presence of god <laughs> like because even to going against that. it is going towards it or something, right? Like, right. You'd have to want that. That's the. This is kind of the map. Even if you're map, map God, of you're still right, going right. towards him, right? Like, you know, you're still Here's the map. Him. So yeah. you've got pre-mortal existence, earth life, and the spiritual world. You can choose to either not be part of it, choose to be part of it, and then by your works, you either end up in normal heaven closer to God or next to God in terms of intimacy to the source of everything. Does that sound like, does that yeah, sound? It drives, man, it drives. I just, I'm just not familiar with, with the, the term. So I'm just like nodding. Cause I don't, I don't know what all these things mean, but I'm just, I'm accepting like what you say is like the, you know, that it sounds, you know, fairly familiar. Does that work for Hinduism to you? Does that work? Well, for there's, there's a difference because this final judgment, this soteriology um, is very different. Um, you know, like the whole Christian paradigm is like leading up to this day when uh, Jesus Christ will uh, return and, you know, raise the dead and, uh, will, you know, save the righteous and, you know, punish the miscreants. And At least for Paulines. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm not trying to like... Uh, oh, for sure. Saying? But like, you it's don't... You don't that Vishnu's yeah. not supposed to... There's not like a... Isn't there a last avatar of Vishnu coming back to do similar things or not? That's just that's just before the, the other avatar comes. It says there's many avatars as there's waves on the ocean. In fact, there's avatars in play right now. Not human, I'm saying. But like, um, uh, for example, the mantra is an avatar. That's a type of avatar, mantra avatar. Another type you could say is the deity in the temple. This is called Archa avatar, right? There, there, you know, there's uh, the, the Vishnu who's lying actually in the ocean is not like the highest Vishnu. He is also avatar. It's called Purusha avatar. Then there's Leela avatar. There's so many classification of avatar. So it's like a big discussion. Uh, I just don't think the cyclical time thing is more like it's got slots to like fit everybody. 
you know, because it's infinite. Like you're just like, oh, this is your karma. We're just gonna slot you. In. Like you got you got a space for you, you know. I agree. I don't, I don't think know. it's about the same way different. as it is. I think you're you at least do you think you have as much say in the judgment as anything else? Because it's like your work that ends up like if you wanted to be close to well, tell try to use this map to describe the the Vishnu approach. Like how do I end up next to Vishnu? Does this map kind of work if you could re-describe it? No. So Vishnu, Vishnu is all about he's Baba Grahi Janardana. He is the one, he is the eater of of Bhav, of your sentiments. He likes to enjoy. Uh, through your enjoyment like so he um he really is like a, a connoisseur of relationships you could say so they're like getting close yeah like for example like there's this there's this classic s statement many gurus have said in different traditions that the mosquito is also up by on the body of the guru very close but he's biting guru. <laughs> so it's not always desirable even to be right next to God. You got to kind of like verse deserve and desire. I, that's my understanding. Like you should try to find out. So for the Vaishnavas, at least you're always trying to get more devotion. You're not trying to get salvation. You're not even trying to stand next to Krishna. You're trying to like, how can I get like, you're scheming on like how you, you have like a type of greed. You have like a like a miser. It says karpanya. Like you are a miserly person who feels, you know, like no matter how rich a rich person is, they always feel like I need more. I need more wealth. So like a real devotee is like not like, oh, now I got this devotion. Let me spend my devotion capital and get salvation. It's like no, no, <laughs> you don't understand the real greed here, bro. The real thing is, if Vishnu approaches me, how hard have I prepared not to take anything from him? <laughs> like he wants to give you. He will force him. He will force you to take your desires but like can i actually get to him like without desire like and be like only desiring more devotion so like the secret is devotion i feel like material enjoyment as a byproduct of religion is misdirection salvation is also misdirection anybody who's actually a servant of god only desires more service to god and i feel like that's the problem like people with the soteriology they're too concerned about their own salvation it's like do you not believe the lord is merciful you really right. doubt it? So I a hundred percent agree. That's like, I think the issue with this, like ignore the red letters because the idea is basically just like your closeness to God. Like you choose, like no matter what happens, there's no hell unless you choose that on purpose. And then there's like intimacy to God, right? Like how close you want to be to being. Hey, we're, we're missing out right now. Like you don't have to die to go to heaven. If like the, the, the more you go inward meditating. So like, the, I would say the main difference between these two is there's practices. There's like mantra and meditation and like there's certain practices for going inward to it to into the state of consciousness because that's where God is actually. He's deeper into the consciousness. He's the origin of your conscious. It's a conscious metaphysics, right? He is the yeah, highest. I wish I had the video of it. When I was a kid, one time I randomly was brought to a Mormon church. It wasn't like I was going there. Like I just went to a bunch of them because I went to different churches, went to you know, went to Hindu temples too, you know. But like they played a kid's video and it was like, once upon a time, there was, uh, you know, this perfect lover of, of all things who prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed, he prayed when he was awake, he prayed when he was asleep. And then eventually he became God, you know, and it was really interesting because the way it was presented was this idea like, this is Adam is Michael is the, you know, um, like some sort of a, like the world that they are, they're getting closer and closer to God. So they're able to create a world and be like a king over a domain, which is bringing people closer to Vishnu or God. So, right? so let me ask you this. What's the timeline? When is, I, I'm just ignorant. I read the book of Mormon when I, when they, you know, when I was like 18 or 17, they came and they gave me the book. I was like, I'll read this. And, yeah, I, it's, cool. and I, for, it's interesting. I had Mormon friends. Growing up. <laughs> I don't know why, but I never really knew anything about it. I just, I you don't drink caffeine soda. Okay, cool. No problem. Sure. Right. We're like kind of like, you know, they're following. They're actually, you know, right. cool. I actually didn't, I don't, I don't, they never rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. Um, I actually like them. But uh, what I was bet. saying is the, uh, uh, what was I trying to say? I, just Sorry, <laughs> I, I, mean, I knew more. <laughs> Poly <laughs> a polytheism or um, no, oh. The, no? Oh, becoming Adam. So, okay, yeah. if you want to merge into the body of God in the Vedas, you can do it, but the Vaishnavas consider this to be basically abominable because there's more pleasure in service to Vishnu than merging into Vishnu. So even though there is a oneness, like he is the soul of the soul, 
the idea is not to merge into him, but to become absorbed in love and become self-forgetful of oneself, not to ontologically be right. And is it you know, exactly. it's possible? So, but you're so then you're helping, of course. But so then, in other words, if I were to want to serve Vishnu the best I could to have my own world where I am that planet and it has billions of people worshiping Vishnu in now it. You can become Brahma. You can become because Brahma. I'm becoming their Holy Spirit. That is. Oh, no, I get you. Okay, I get you. Yeah, no, all of the devas, all of the, the demigods, they're not demigods. It's like a wrong, like sub gods. Demigod is half human, half God for Greeks, but like Hercules. Um, but, uh, but to become like a smaller god, like a, with like a, a terrestrial domain, all those are stations. Like you could occupy yeah. the post of Brahma. You could become the creator of a world. That's what's called Siddhi. So there's like eight mystic perfections. And you, if you have all of them together and you get like another perfection, you can like become. Uh, How do I know, spell that? Becoming lighter. Siddhi. S-I-D-D-H-I. Siddhi. Look up Ashta Siddhi. A-S-T-A. So there's eight mystic powers, like becoming lighter than the lightest, becoming smaller than the smallest, becoming larger than the largest, this kind of stuff, choosing one's own time of death, choosing one's own time of birth, being able to control others, obtaining things out of the ether, fulfilling all of one's desires, you know, seeing the minds of others, you know, that kind of stuff, traveling at the speed of mind. So do, would you say that that kind of is, would that be one of the highest forms of, of serving Vishnu? Is to no. Be, no. Oh man, it's still within samsara. It's just the upper part of samsara. Right. So like it's right. it's 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 an indicate it's symptomatic of a degree of freedom. So like because you're pure enough, you're allowed to break some of the material rules because you're not gonna hurt anybody. So like one way to get siddhis is through tapas. Like you're doing you're not you're not allowing yourself to enjoy essentially in tapas. You're tormenting yourself in essentially like so. For example, you become celibate. I guess it's a type of tapas, right? So you don't allow yourself any sexual pleasure. Another thing is you start fasting a lot, like so you don't enjoy food. You may start avoiding sleep, like now you're not enjoying sleep either. And uh, unless you give up all your possessions, you start walking around in the hot sun, so you're not enjoying the weather even. <laughs> and you're not enjoying any fixed place of residence, and you're not enjoying any family relations. So you start doing this tapas and just like meditating on the Ishtadeva, right? And offering all of this sacrifice. This is all sacrifice, of course. To the Ishta Deva, you start disturbing the karmic balance, right? So if like, there's like nothing you can be rewarded with materially, that's where the magic powers start to come in. That's how you. That's where the sorcery and all that stuff, like being able to bend matter to your mind, you have to have a very strong mind if you're going to be like violating the rules of the material world. And uh, many um, bad people have also taken up those kind of practices with bad intent. So. Right. It's like, yeah, just getting material power, like lording it over the rules of nature is not actually spiritual. That's just I was like, a world. How many people would kill each other in my belly? Right. Good. Nice one. <laughs> so like, yeah, like what if, what if you use like demons have done this, you know, like there was one demon, Haranya Kashipu. He stood on his tiptoes with his hands up in the air like this for like hundred million years. So much so that like ants build like an ant, like ant hill around and like ate all his flesh. But he kept his prana, his life force, circulating in inside of his bones, right? And his, his, he got so hot that there was like fire coming out the top of this ant hill, and the smoke was like reaching up all the, into the heavens and choking all the gods. And eventually, Brahma came down and like poured, like water on the fire, like put it out, and like gave him back his healthy body and said, "Please take from me what you will." And he said, "Make me immortal." And he said, "I can't. Only Vishnu can do that." And then. Uh, then he said, well, then make it so I can die neither the day or the night. So I cannot die inside or outside a house. And I cannot be killed by any god or uh, man, right? So he tried, to, he tried to be clever and he tried to figure a way out. But then Vishnu had to come and kill him because he was uh, – and he killed him in the threshold of the door in between day and night and not on land or air but, like, on his lap. And he became like, – <laughs> he, he, like, ripped him in half and, like, pulled his guts out. But um, so, like uh, – yeah, there's ways you can try to trick the. So I, I think that's like you shouldn't be focusing on magic powers. That's a derailment. Another higher yeah. material material type of enjoyment, like a material desires. Like you're, if you you could cultivate it as like a spiritual practice, like just just like a mental exercise. Like maybe you could pick one of the magic mystic powers and try to cultivate it um, to see to test how strong your mind is. It could be like a test of strength of mind. But I think 
I think they're a little too tempting. Um, for at least, I, as some people say, they're not interested. I think anybody would be interested if they're in reach. But uh, yeah, I would just consider it like a higher level of materialism, actually. Like, it's not a very great thing, you know. Um, you know, the gods can do all these things. They don't have to abide by these mundane, like, they can fly, they can travel at mine. Figure out something you can do for Vishnu he can't do for himself. That sounds like a, that's, that's how you get to the thing. Yeah, well, that's that's a very high thing. That's the Vaishnava thing, like, serving the servants. Like, humbling, being humble. Like, people think, oh, like, oh, you're... At least you can serve the servants. Especially in the serve the servants. <laughs> No, but uh, I think the thing is, uh, serving God is as simple as serving the self. For every action, there is action. Maybe uh, serving no. someone else's self. I feel like serving the serving self. self uh, uh, yeah, like where's the test? Where's the load bearing test on that one? It's yeah, I like of, this map it's kind right of hard here. To, it's kind but, of hard uh, to yourself. You know, what do you think of this loaded map? High level, perhaps, perhaps. If you're so Prapi, great, you know, prakamamyam ish itvam vashitavam anima mahima. Oh, ishitvam, you know, lordship. That's also Aishwarya or Ishitam, becoming right. an Ishwara. Anima, becoming smaller than the smallest. That's here, 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 That's yeah. where Bhakti is right there. Actually, Bhakti is right there under Vishitvam. But you're, the, the, the target here is influencing God, but not really. Influencing God by giving up all influence over him. It's the opposite. So it's a really an inversion of that one. Mahima, great, means becoming physically very big. You know, Garima, becoming very heavy. Lagima, light, lighter, like float, like levitation. Yeah, so well, becoming, we need to uh, make this map mean what you're talking about because really the, that's just huge. The problem is people thinking that they're going to do things that everyone else can already do. There are gods out there or God has archons already people out there doing these do things. things. No, you can yeah, occupy yeah, a post of Brahma. You can become you can become Adam or whatever, I guess, if you want to refer to it. Yeah, that. but like, you know, what's the real what's the value you're adding to the cosmogony, bro? Yeah, what this are you doing the for the Dharma? What are you doing for gods? Like where, where, where's the compassion? Like what are you doing for others? Like for oneself is like not it's not a very high thing. I mean, everybody does for oneself. I mean I brush my teeth, you know. <laughs> You know, you got to do something for yourself. But, Will, responsibility, yeah. love, humility, helping, contribution, economy, uh, searching. This is going to be part of my new IBIS scouts when we replace the Boy Scouts. That's going to be the new code they're going to have to follow. It'll be a Lotus Scout. That'll be how we do Lotus it. Lotus Scout. What is this? Garuda Scouts? <laughs> Got to come up with some new youth group. Well, it's been two hours. I really love yeah, you. Yeah, it's time. You had the time, man. That was awesome. Can we do it again soon? You're going to be able to come back? Because there's a lot more questions now. Yeah, why not? Sure. That's my <laughs> no, you're very gracious to share your platform. I don't have anything like to like link to me. I'm not trying to like. Eh, this is like like my minimum. I can just do some public service announcements. Like, it's just <laughs> well, let's play our little Krishna song, and I'll see you soon, man. God bless you. Hari Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hari Bol.